Seems to be, I um, mean, the mic's working, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the most we want to try? Have you done a shirt? Desktop audio coming. Yeah. Movement. It's working. Well, I'm not quite there yet. But. All right. All right. That's for some reason, it's going slightly slower. I wonder what that happened to do when it left the building. Huh. A bit of shock. Mm. It seems to be a time lag of about. Right. We need another cable. It's working, so just there's a bit of a time lag at the moment. It's at the, um, what, one of these? No, um, uh, Ethernet cable. Um, just for the. Uh, there wouldn't be a strong enough signal with a, the Wi Fi. So we need to actually have a physical cable. Alright. So <laughs> that's him talking to me, but he hasn't been here for about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
we get to see it from Group Triple A. Can't blame it. Sure. <laughs> I said to Nathaniel, you're not allowed to go home, you just got to stay home. <laughs> 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 no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm not Nathaniel's living now, so I'll just let him know. Yeah, that's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Is Charlotte working? Yes, she is. What's her job again? She's having an intern with NHS. So we got the scheme. Yeah, yeah, good. It's quite good. It's uh, well. in, in Belfast? I am a school hospital. Oh, that's good. It's not too bad. So Tony, she works at home. We're just uh, trying to get the streaming up here because uh, there are two Johnny in uh, Stephen, hi, hi. Johnny in uh, Galway direction. Don't worry. He's, he's nice on it. And uh, Stephen uh, uh, at the moment has had a test and is waiting for a result. He was doing a funeral and somebody at the funeral was test positive and uh, now he's really had a test. So, uh, it may well be negative, but I told him just to stay behind the bed or something. Is David Joyce coming up? Yeah, apparently. He's going to stay, did he? Yes, yeah, apparently. So. Yes. I offered him a couple of days the last time, so I can't do it. Yeah, he messaged me that. I don't know where he's staying. Yeah, well, he messaged me and said, Harry, things in the hospital. And I said, well, this is before he even yeah. mentioned. So guys, just pick a seat and then you've got to stay in that seat for the three days. You can't move to a different one. All right. Good night. I'll think I was working. No? I think it is working, but I think he's maybe adjusting another set. Is he? I don't know. Okay, I'll check it again. Thank you. 
I'm assuming those other two guys are on because it says three in the chat. So but for some reason we're a bit. Seems to be a time lag. Yeah, it will always be. There will be a. Um, there is always a delay. Streaming up and running for a couple of people for John A. and somewhere in the Galway direction. Uh, Stephen Collin and Lisburn, so There's one more to come. Can I ask me? Can I make this come to the seven? Should there be one more? Who's the other one? Andy. Andy here? No, did Andy tell me something? I think Andy maybe sent me a message. Hang on. They won't be here this morning. Right. There's a, a hospital appointment. So, um, <coughs> this is going to be recorded as well, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stream. Yeah. You can get that then. I'll catch up. That's, that's, not, that's not us. That's not us. <laughs> <laughs> 373 subscribers. Don't think so. <laughs> that's the Mormon College of the Bible. <laughs> <there or not>? <laughs> <laughs> It's irishbaptistcollege.org mm -hmm. forward slash MA dash YouTube. It's forward slash MA dash YouTube. There we are live. Or, or as near live as ever will be. Check a couple of times during the morning. These guys that are yeah, they're all right. It's on the till bar now. I think it's up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll start recording after all. Do you need picture in picture? Or are you okay? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm firing this up, but they will have that on Google anyway. They'll have the PowerPoint in there. We'll have to see what's gonna happen. Yeah. 
all, do, all donations towards uh, technology. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come again. Yes, I, I, I could, yeah, reading your email, I thought maybe you wouldn't be here at all today. Oh, no, yeah, and I'll be, I'll be straight back again. I'll That's okay. No, you're very welcome. Sorry about the slight delay. Uh, hopefully the guys who are, are watching in, two people streaming today, and it will also be recorded uh, as well if there's any issue. Uh, can I just say to, to the guys who are, who are streaming in that there is a, a slight time lag on that. Nigel says about 30 seconds, and uh, 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 we'll not be aware of it. Uh, you'll hopefully not be aware of it, but uh, it should work out all right. Uh, so this is the MA module in preaching. It is joint taught by myself and David Luke. Uh, I think everybody knows who I am, but I'm not sure that everybody knows who everybody else is in the room. So just for the sake of uh, fulfilling all righteousness, we're going to do quick introductions. Um, so I'm Edwin Yurt, the principal of the college. I teach a whole range of things, including half, well, maybe slightly more than half of this module. Uh, so we're going to start maybe at the back with, with David, if you want to do that, then we'll work sort of a Malix round, okay? Just say who you are, where you're from. Okay, my name is David Joyce, I'm a Scotsman, presently living in Cork. Uh, what do you do? Maybe you should ask on that. Uh, at the moment, I'm studying and I'm caring for my two daughters. So I'm a family husband pain. Okay, <laughs> all right. Hello, yeah. My name is Alex. Okay, and uh, he, Alex has the, the joy of having me in the congregation, so he, he just hasn't been able to escape sermon critique at all. It's a terrible thing, but I, I've assured him that now that he's graduated from the college, I won't be giving him any more of that. So uh, uh, that's not to suggest he's the finished article, but then none of us are in this matter of preaching, as we will discover during this module. Uh, okay, so uh, coming here to Joyce, yes. maybe? Okay, thank you. Noel? Uh, my name is uh, Noel, Noel Johnson. I'm from Banana. Um, so it's hobby farming and uh, currently uh, salt of the chicken. Hobby farming? That's right, yeah. uh, for a tiny Noel, that still sounds fairly exhausting to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Good to see you again. And then uh, we'll run from Nathaniel straight across and then to the front hand. Marks and Spencer's man, so anybody wanting any free vouchers, you know who to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yes, ma'am. I'm Michael, Michael Thompson. I'm from Dingannon, uh, retired from the early Dingannon Baptist Church. And I'm only serving in this. A new discount. Well, there you are. The writing's on the wall. Lovely. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, my name is Andy. Uh, I am from uh, Crawley, just outside London, but I'm currently living in Dungannon. Um, I'm the uh, land evangelist at Roy, Roy Methodist Church. Lovely. That's great, thank you. And you're leaving early today. It's not because you're offended by anything that's been said. Well, you don't know that yet, but uh, it's for a different reason, Andy. Yes, okay. Uh, and Johnny, uh, Johnny Pollock is streaming in from 
somewhere in County Galway. I think I hope that's right, Johnny. I may have got that wrong. I'm sure you'll correct me uh, in due course. And Stephen Hanna uh, is also, but Stephen, God willing, will be joining us uh, uh, probably tomorrow or maybe even later on today. Uh, so uh, hopefully that streaming will work out all right. Uh, now, having done those introductions, I think we should pray at this point and then I'll mention one or two things by way of announcement about what way we operate this during these three days. Uh, because with the current climate, we need to say one or two things about that. So we'll pray first of all and ask for God's help. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together today. We praise you for the way that you've enabled us to come. And we ask that uh, in the strange environment in which we find ourselves at present uh, in society, uh, we pray that you will uh, keep us safe, uh, that you'll help us to be able to come each day. And we pray that as we uh, turn to this subject of preaching, that you'll help us to think clearly about it, uh, to think with biblical focus. And we pray that uh, for those of us who are involved in regular preaching, that this may help us. We pray that for those who do it a little bit, that it might encourage us. And we pray for those who listen to preaching and reflect on it, that it will give us uh, a more clearly informed mind. Uh, so we pray that you'll be with us in each aspect of the module and help us uh, uh, not only as we listen to the lecture material, also as we engage uh, and discuss with one another. We pray that we might know the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, by way of announcement, the program for the three days is on the door, printed, and you can refer to that. Uh, so we start each day at 9.30. Coffee break, I know that's the next thing in your mind. The coffee break will be at 11. And that will be served in the foyer, not in the cafeteria. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, but uh, students are not permitted in the current climate to go around that corner. You can go the, the, the length of the toilets. I know where you, you know where they are, but you can't go down into the cafeteria at all. Um, so, I mean, if there's something you need heated up at lunchtime, you, you may need to ask one of us to do that for you. Uh, but the tea coffee, and again at lunchtime, tea coffee will be served on a trolley out here in the foyer. If it's dry outside, uh, what the undergrads have been doing uh, is all going outside and congregating in the little uh, quad area outside there. Uh, or if it's too cool or it's raining, then basically you can probably find a seat in the foyer or even come back in here uh, and have your biscuit or at lunchtime your sandwich or whatever it is. You know to bring your own packed lunch. I think that that's part of the course. Everybody here has done one of these before, so uh, uh, you know to do that. Uh, social distancing. Uh, you're distanced at the moment. The chairs were measured out by our operations manager. Uh, you have uh, located yourself in a chair. You need to stay in that chair for the three days. I jokingly said to Nathaniel, uh, that means you can't go home, you've just got to stay there. <laughs> you, you stay in the same chair, so don't come in tomorrow and go to a different chair. You've got to stay in that one. Uh, the chair that you're sitting in is fine, by the way. It, it hasn't been used for well over 72 hours, uh, so, so uh, the chair is fine. But please do that. When you go out into the foyer, once you go out this door, you need to put on a, a face covering, whether that's a, a, a mask of some sort or a visor. Uh, the kind of thing that we're using. But you need to do that while you're in the communal areas. While you're sitting in class, you're properly distanced and you don't need to wear the mask uh, according to guidelines that we have. Uh, we're very pleased, by the way, I should say this, that we've been able to, to do this face to face. The guidance that we're following, and it is guidance, it's not regulation. The guidance is that, that uh, if you can do stuff online at uh, distance, then you should do it. Uh, our view of the kind of material that we're handling is that it's vocational material. And so if anyone asks you at any point, why, why is the college doing this face-to-face? -face? The answer is because there are strong elements of our programs right across undergrad and postgrad that are vocational in nature that can't really be done effectively uh, uh, online. And uh, so... Um, if at all possible, we try to, to maintain this. Now, we keep it under review, 
so it depends. We want to be wise and sensible and, and keep a Christian witness. And obviously, if uh, there was a more stringent lockdown upon us, even, I mean, who knows? Probably going to announce something at midnight tonight. It could be that we would all simply have to disperse and, and, uh, and go on. But insofar as possible, with God's help, we'll continue to do it in this way. Uh, and I, I hope that you'll find that we are observing uh, in the building all the regulations. But the other thing I need to say is uh, wash your hands regularly. So when you go out of here, I'd say even before you, you have your tea, coffee, uh, and at lunchtime again, uh, go to one of the facilities, wash your hands thoroughly, and use sanitizer as well, uh, and make sure that you, you just observe the usual uh, guidelines that the government have laid down. Now, can I ask, are there any questions about any of that, or if you think I've missed something? All happy? Is that okay? Now, uh, David and I obviously teach the module together, and so I do today. Uh, uh, so it'll be two sessions this morning, this one, and then one after coffee, and then after lunchtime there'll be another session, uh, and then uh, there will be a break at that stage. Uh, while well, you're free, that's it, finished for the day. And then tomorrow morning, I do the first half, and then David kicks in uh, in the afternoon. Uh, he and I are kind of jointly involved a wee bit in the afternoon, and then he'll do Wednesday morning again. And we'll talk later on about the assignment in more detail. There are two elements uh, to the assessment for this module, uh, which will be revealed. Now, at this point, I, I need to point out to you that the material that I will be handling here today and tomorrow is on Moodle. So it would be good if you've got an electronic device, I think, uh, uh, to be able to follow those notes. You will not be given out uh, uh, handout notes because we, we've stopped doing that in the current climate, just handing out material. Uh, so you've really got to come prepared with your computer or phone or whatever and access Moodle and you'll find in this module, which is TH7525, I think. I think that's right. My material is visible. David's is not yet visible, I don't think. I think he's hidden that because he's still uh, fine-tuning one or two things. But you will find there my notes and also uh, the PowerPoint slides that are coming up here. Uh, so if you think that I've advanced the slides too quickly and you missed something, don't worry, it's all there. You'll be able to catch it up uh, at your leisure later. Is that all right? So uh, can I check everybody? Can everybody see that on Moodle? Uh, good, we're, we're good to go. That's great. Okay, uh, now during the course of the module, I'll be recommending a number of books. Uh, and some I'll not be recommending, but I'll be saying that you need to look at them. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm not, my custom is usually to spread out a lot of books on tables. Not doing that because of the current... Uh, folk handling books and passing them on to somebody else is not. But I'm going to mention three right at the outset that I will be referring to during the course of this material. Your Way with God's Word. David Schlafer, Your Way with God's Word, which is Cowley Publications. And uh, I'll be right at the outset saying a few things from that. Uh, the subtitle of the book is Discovering Your Distinctive Preaching Voice. Discovering your distinctive preaching voice. Uh, the second one is this book by Michael Quick, 360 Degree Preaching, Hearing, Speaking and Living the Word. This is a very fine book and I will recommend that very heartily to you. It's by Baker Academic, tutor in preaching and communication uh, in Illinois in the United States. He was previously at Spurgeon's College in London. So 360 degree. And then something by John Stott. I nearly always go back to default uh, uh, with uh, good old John Stott. Between two worlds, the challenge of preaching today, the challenge of preaching today, I think that this was uh, also published in maybe a, a, it was either a later version or an earlier one under the title, I Believe in Preaching. So it's, it's the same book with a different title, all right? And this by John Stott is superb. Now, it will be an interactive module uh, because from time to time I'll pause and say any questions, any comments. Uh, I may throw up something for discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get into little groups. We've got to stay in our distance. Uh, so we'll, we'll just be 
treating it as, as one group together. You will also hopefully, hopefully, if the technology works, be looking at a couple of uh, or three video clips uh, that I want you to, to access. And then uh, in our preaching workshop, we'll definitely be doing that. So we'll move heaven and earth to make sure that happens. And we're going to look at a number of different uh, examples of preaching style. And we'll ask you to reflect on those. But that's when David and I will do that together. So, introduction. This module assumes that everyone has experience of preaching. What do I mean by that? Either doing it or listening to it. And some of you, as I've indicated perhaps in the prayer at the beginning, preach at least occasionally. The module is not about the basics of how to preach. So it's not quite the same as our homiletics module at undergraduate level or our sermon class, something like that. It's not like that, but rather how to reflect on preaching and to develop your preaching instinct and your preaching skills. The module assumes that the participants, that's you, work, generally speaking, in the context of a church or church-related ministry and will have an opportunity to speak publicly on some occasion, to do something on some occasion. Now, if that throws anybody into a tailspin this morning, don't let it throw you into a tailspin because the assessment, although it, it part of the assessment reflects on something that you have either done, it can also reflect on something that you've heard. Uh, okay, so we, we'll explain more as we go along. So I don't want anybody to be a little worried if you say, well, I, I actually don't preach and, and I, I very rarely get an opportunity to do it. Don't worry about that. Uh, you will still be included uh, as much as others. The module relies heavily on work that you will do rather than on what you can be taught. So in other words, well, you will be taught, but, but uh, the assessment of this it sends you away to, to do your own work on this matter. So these next two days or three days are about making sure that you've got a clear sense of what you need to go and do and how to go about it. And uh, obviously we will not send you on your way in the dark. Uh, you will be sent on your way with as much information as we can possibly give you to enable you to, to fulfill the assessment. So I begin then with what you see on the screen, which is the influence of people, uh, personality, and practice. None of us, you will appreciate, comes to the task of preaching or Christian communication in a vacuum. What are your earliest sermon memories? What piece of communication has made the greatest impression on you? What were the formative influences on your preaching and communication? So uh, let me mention a few things from my own perspective. I, I may have suggested one or two of these in your notes. But uh, uh, this is to give you an example of how to answer that question, speaking from my experience, all right? Uh, my earliest recollections and influences include the following. Prophetic sermons in a particular denominational trajectory. Um, well, let's be honest with one another. I was brought up among the Christian brethren. And uh, so I went very frequently to prophetic conferences and prophetic meetings and gospel services. I, I think, for example, of going to, now I'm really dating myself, uh, being taken as a little boy by the hand to gospel crusades in Mid-Ulster uh, in a large marquee uh, around the town of Garva, somewhere around the town of Garva, sponsored by TBF Thompson, and the preacher was Headley Murphy, a brother and evangelist. And uh, I can still smell the tent. If I close my eyes, I can hear the music, which was excellent, uh, organ, piano, and a choir, and I can still hear him preaching. Uh, and those were very early influences uh, on my understanding of what preaching was about. Also, uh, Bible storybooks and flannel graph figures. You say, what on earth was that? Flannel graph was little sticky 
uh, figures of Bible characters that you stuck up on a felt board. And actually, when later in life, when I came to do Baptist Youth Children's Camps, Alan Baird and I and our wives ran children's camps for about nine years, and we quite often used flannel graph. That was cutting edge in our day. Now, of course, you would never dream of doing anything like that, but that was influential on me in thinking about how to communicate with children. Later, the expositional ministry of Jim Smith, Pastor Jim Smith, now in the glory. Uh, he did series after series on Bible books at Macrofelt Baptist Church uh, when I was a late teenager and then into my early 20s before I, I came to IBC as a student. Uh, and listening to him uh, cultivated an interest in me in progressively working through the Bible in understanding. So I've still got the notes. Uh, I treasure them. Uh, some notes of his on the letter of James and uh, some notes on other Bible books as well. But the James one sticks out in my mind particularly. Wonderful uh, expository series. I also think of the influence of this man, John Stott. Uh, so later on, when I, I went to university and began to uh, be interested more in preaching and began to sense a call of God into the ministry, I began to listen to people like John Stott. I heard him in the flesh a few times uh, and listening to his tapes. Again, I'm dating myself. Uh, but you know that you can go on to the All Souls uh, uh, media resources and you can pull up uh, audio, not so much video material of him but audio sermons of John Stott, they are worth their weight in gold, I want to tell you. Uh, and so he was influential. And then later, when I went into the ministry, uh, Dick Lucas and the Ministry of the Proclamation Trust, I first went with Leslie Hutchinson to the Evangelical Ministry Assembly in 1997. I just started, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure that's even correct. I say 1997, I think it was actually more like 92 or 93 when I came to Belfast from Letterkenny. And uh, I went with Leslie to the EMA, Evangelical Ministry Assembly, and it was in Westminster Central Hall the first year I went. John, uh, Dick Lucas was speaking on 1 Corinthians. I was spellbound. I began to realize that the way I'd been handling the Bible up to that point, that there was a basic flaw in it. Because I hadn't made what Dick Lucas calls the journey to Corinth. I, I had not given sufficient credence to the idea of context. Who did this letter come to? Who wrote it? Who did it come to? What was their situation? Before I could understand how to apply it to other people. I needed to understand that first of all. So uh, all of that was, was enormously influential uh, in my experience. So let me pause at that point uh, and ask um, anybody in the room like to volunteer what has been the most influential thing uh, in, in your preaching formation? Any volunteers? Are the guys who are streaming or thinking at this point, what was it in my early life that really influenced me with regard to preaching? What do you think, Andy? I'm, I'm sorry, you're just sitting under my nose, so I'm going to light upon you. I think uh, my influence in preaching, um, my, my, my early life, I, I grew up in a church where the preaching was, it wasn't, it wasn't that it was bad preaching, it was, it was kind of safe preaching in a sense, almost, almost like sharing a thought rather than yep. preaching. All right. Um, I think, I think in later, later years and as I, as I moved on to um, different churches, I started listening to more people like John Piper, yeah. um, Paul Washer, who were, who were yeah. That, yeah. That, had, that, that, that challenged my, my earlier experience of what preaching was. Okay, so, so Andy's saying for the benefit of the guys who are streaming, uh, early preaching was safe. It wasn't so much expository. It was more thoughts from the Bible. And then he began to listen to folk like John Piper, Paul Washer. Folk like, although different, uh, that kind of had an influence on you. We'll pick one other person. Um, 
Noel, anything you'd like to say? Um, well, I grew up in the uh, Church of Ireland, uh, a church that I attended. I wouldn't say there was any really memorable uh, sermons there. Um, the earliest sermon I would have, uh, would have been as a young child, would have been a harvest service, and it would have been, um, would have been another Church of Ireland minister who was certainly saved. Uh, and that, that had because it was actually going through the text and explaining it, which I hadn't heard of uh, uh, before. Yes. Um, uh, but I wasn't saved back then. Uh, I'd been saved when I was around 30. I uh, started listening to people. Well, the first, uh, Vernon McGee was, I don't know if you know that person, Vernon McGee, uh, through the Bible series, mm -hmm. I mean, really black and white mm -hmm. teaching through the Bible, which yeah. was really refreshing. And then uh, leading on to people like uh, Steve Lawson, uh, Alistair Bay, stuff like that there. Yeah. So, okay, good. Uh, and again, nice plain uh, uh, black and white. Teaching. All right. Uh, so Noel's experience ha has been one in the past of not being converted, listening to maybe a minister that wasn't very clear, then listening to uh, obviously a man who was saved, who... who uh, preached in a more expository way, taking people through the text. And then later, Vernon McGee, you mentioned, I don't know this name, maybe others here are familiar with that. Uh, he was influential. And then uh, moving on, listening to people like Steve Lawson, Alistair Begg, and so on. The, the beauty of our, our uh, options today uh, is that we've got such facility at our fingertips. Uh, um, so the World Wide Web can be a bad thing, but it also can be a wonderful thing. We've got so many resources uh, at our fingertips. And you can pull up a preacher on nearly any subject you like and listen to them. So, we're all shaped, in other words, by what we've heard, especially in regard to preaching. This is true of normal personal development in any case, and it is also true of the style and content of our preaching. David Schlafer asks a very important question. And the question is, what is in your hand? What is it that God has given you for this task? Uh, so Schlafer on page nine begins to tell a story, which I will recount in very quick summary form for you. Uh, he begins to tell the story of someone called George. And on page nine, he says, this is the start of a preaching class. So picture sermon class at the Irish Baptist College. One of its members, one of the students, rushes into my office, he says, out of breath, and says, I can't come to class today. He was due to present. Can I say this has happened occasionally at IBC? And uh, it kind of throws you off guard because you're thinking, right, what are we going to do here? What are we going to put in place? Because this student can't do it. Uh, so Schlafer, I was not impressed because beforehand, this was obviously not ill. Here he was in college. He was going to offer me some lame explanation for an unfinished sermon. I was gathering myself to give him a stern professional rebuke. He said, I'm very sorry, my daughter's just got sick. My wife can't leave work to come home and stay with her. I really wanted to deliver this sermon today. I've worked hard on it. And I was looking forward to sharing it with the whole group. I felt a little ashamed because I'd gathered myself to rebuke him. And I said, look, why don't you leave it with me? And I'll present it to the class. Give me your notes, and I'll present your sermon. Uh, uh, and so chastened, I took his sermon text along and did as I had promised. And when I'd finished, I said to the group, what did you think? They said almost unanimously to me, this was a very good sermon. But the problem is, it was George's sermon. It sounds like him, but it doesn't work the same when you try to preach it. Everybody agreed with this. You see, says Schlafer, <clears throat> George and I could no more trade sermons than we could have traded signatures or fingerprints. We have different preaching voices. And I have never seen that fact so clearly as on that occasion. So a different preaching signature. A different preaching voice. So uh, what we've got to do is to uh, come to some kind of an understanding of what our preaching voice is. 
uh, what our preaching signature is, uh, and then look at our sermons and get others to give us feedback on our sermons so that we hone and shape that so that we become not clones of somebody else. Now, already this morning we've said we've been influenced by different preachers. And I think that's right and proper. All of us are influenced. But we don't want to become that person. We've got to avoid becoming clones of our favourite preacher. There's nothing so false as listening to somebody who uh, is trying to imitate somebody else. It's an awful thing. So we say, be yourself. Now, I will qualify that comment, be yourself, uh, in a minute or two. So let me ask you this, still thinking about this business of influences. Uh, I need to not wander too much away from the camera. Uh, but what are your views on sermon critique? How do you think preachers cope with evaluation? What experience do you have of being evaluated? So I think I'll go to the second question uh, because it's more specific uh, and ask you, and I'm going to ask Michael here if he'd like to say something about this. How do you think preachers cope with evaluation? Now, you're, you're an elder in a local church. You, you listen to a lot of preaching. You do a bit yourself. Um, what, do, what do you think about this? How, how do preachers cope with it when they get it? Yeah. So Michael's making the point for the benefit of the guys. Uh, I'm not sure whether you pick this up on the microphone. Possibly not. But uh, for the benefit of our, our guys who are streaming, uh, there, there's a balance in this matter of critique in that if, if the, the evaluation you get all the time is constantly negative, well, you might have done this, you might have done that. Here's something you omitted to say. Uh, you said too much, whatever. If it's all negative, then that's not particularly helpful. So we need a balance. We need, we need some of that work uh, because none of us, as we indicated at the beginning, are the finished article. But we, we also need positivity. We need encouragement. Uh, not that we court adulation. And uh, I've often said to the undergrads that the most dangerous place in any church building is right at the door on the exit. So the little mat at the door where people wipe their feet, where you shake hands with people in, in a bygone era. <laughs> uh, that, that is the most dangerous place in a church building because there, there are some very kind people in church, also some rascals, but there are some very kind people in church who will give you adulation. So I never heard the like of that before. Wonderful, fantastic. Oh, what a gift you have. As a wee man in Ballymena, I used to do this tongue in cheek with me. He hasn't been out in a long time. He's in very poor health. Uh, and he used to say to me after I'd preached, I did a lot during the vacancy there. And uh, he used to say to me in the way out, did you ever think of going into preaching? <laughs> so he, but he was a great encourager. I, I, I knew what he meant by that. But, but we need that balance, don't we? Uh, and the last question is what experience do you have of being evaluated? So... Just for maybe a, a minute or no, 30 seconds, just think, how have I been evaluated professionally, anecdotally, maybe by, by my spouse, who actually is always going to be one of your best critics because they see you warts and all. And uh, can I say that my wife uh, still points out to me one or two of my little idiosyncrasies, one or two of my little bad habits, 
and uh, she'll smile and say, you're still doing that, you know. And I say, oh, no, 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 I don't want... I wasn't, and I deny it, but I was. Uh, watching yourself on a video is one of the most sobering things possible. And actually, the lockdown experience, where we've had to do a lot of preaching online, some of us, has been particularly sobering. And so I know that there are many preachers who have done retake after retake after retake and stop the blessed thing and, and then done that last paragraph again. And the, the problem is then the guy who's editing this has got to try and fit all that together. My practice was just to go for it. So I didn't stop. Even I thought I'd made a slip. Uh, so I, I mean, on, on, a, on a famous occasion, early in lockdown, I announced my passage uh, and read it and began to preach and I'd given them the wrong passage. I discovered at the end. I'd given them the wrong chapter, correct book, but wrong chapter. You know, I mean, how stupid. Then I'm beating myself up thinking, what am I going to do? Am I going to repeat this all? And when I spoke to somebody, they said, look, uh, it's quite easy for us just to edit that word out and we'll put it up on the screen what the chapter is. So there are ways of getting around it. But think for a second about your evaluation. Did you do anything online during lockdown? What was that like? It gave you an opportunity actually to self-reflect. No matter what anybody said to you, you got a sense of how you did it yourself. Now, let me follow that by saying that a key part of the assessment, the part two of the assignment, part two, will be setting up a process of evaluation in regard to your preaching or communication or in regard to somebody else's preaching and communication to encourage reflection about what has been shaping you. There will also be a, a grid, which is this, that will enable you uh, to express your sense of the influences that have affected you. Now, whenever we give this grid out uh, in previous iterations of, of this module, uh, folk uh, were constantly either on email or on the phone saying, I don't understand how you do that grid. Uh, because you can see along the top line, you've got the influence of theology, tradition, culture, personality, preparation, prayer, and down this side, the content of all of that, the style of all of that, the expectation that you have about all of that. So, so in other words, what are you going to write in this box? You say, what are you going to write in that box? And uh, so in case you are, uh, I've employed this word in the past year, discomfobulated by all that. I'm not sure it's a real word, I invented it. If that throws you into a tailspin, uh, we have, in an act of great mercy, uh, put an example grid up on, on Moodle, and it's there somewhere, I think, on, on that, the first three or four items on the Moodle page. So have a look at that. It's anonymous, and uh, you'll be able to see what someone else did about three or four, five years ago uh, on this grid. It'll give you an example. Now, obviously, you're not going to write what they wrote, because this, this is your work, personally. You will have to submit that. It will not be marked, but you'll have to submit that as part of that assignment too. So, so uh, that comes in just to let us see that you've thought a wee bit about this, that you've engaged with your, your, your own reflection on this. So all of those issues uh, uh, will be involved. Now, at this point, I, I want to move on and look at this uh, business of your own distinctive preaching voice. Developing your own voice or signature uh, is the whole idea of David Schlafer. Some background here on Schlafer's thinking. Preoccupation with one's own preaching, says Schlafer, can quite easily become idolatrous. Well, uh, Yes, you can understand that. If you think that your relationship with God is all about your preaching and your ministry, then you're making it an idol. Isn't that true? Um, some of us are facing this big style as retirement approaches. I speak for myself. Uh, not, not tomorrow or the next day now. It's uh, a year or two hence. But, but as that approaches, you've got to think about the future. If my ministry was taken away, so here I am, I lecture, I preach, I'm a busy person. If all of that is removed, what's my relationship to God? Was that ministry an idol? Something that actually substituted for a living relationship and devotion to God? 
So I think Schneefer's right on this. If you, you preoccupy too much with it, it could become idolatrous. Now, I hope that that doesn't sound like a contradiction, given uh, what we're looking at in this module. But if a preacher with finite resources and finite time prepares as faithfully as possible, says Schneefer, then it is not only right but essential to leave the rest with God rather than obsess about the result. Not an excuse for slovenliness. Not an excuse for doing all kinds of strange stuff. Uh, as sometimes happens in pulpits. Uh, but it's the danger of making your preaching an idol, I think. However, Schlieffer argues it is nonetheless important to discern and develop your preaching voice or signature. Unfortunately, the much quoted definition, preaching is truth through personality, I've used that quite often, has sometimes been used as a license or even an injunction for preachers to let all their weirdness hang out. So, this guy at the front is waxing eloquent about something, and you think, this is really bizarre. Have you, have you ever been in a meeting like that? This, this, is, this is odd. What on earth is he, is he trying to do? Uh, and he, he's letting all his weirdness as Schlaver puts it, he's an American, but he's saying <laughs> he's letting all his, his weirdness, all his idiosyncrasies, all his warts uh, and everything out there uh, for, for public consumption, out there in the public view. So, says Schlaver, be attentive to scripture. Be rooted in Christian history and doctrine. Be faithful to the gospel. Be sensitive to the needs of your congregation. All of those things are absolutely crucial. And don't let them be swept aside by this idea of being yourself. Schneefer says that can be used regrettably as an excuse for all kinds of bad habits. So his encouragement with regard to being yourself uh, is to relegate that to a secondary question or a secondary status. He says the prime and prior question is, what have I got here? What have I got here? What have I got in my hand? That's the question. Listen to the voices of scripture and culture and congregation and tradition and so on. Ask yourself what it is that God has given to you. And then, on the basis of all of that, deliver to the congregation or to your hearers, wherever they are, what needs to be communicated. Now, he tells a, a, an interesting story. It's a, like a little parable, but it's a, a sort of biblical parable. I'm not going to read it for you, but I, I encourage you, if you uh, get a hold of this or have a look at it in the library at some point, um, uh, to, to have a look and uh, sort of jot down your thoughts on this little parable. The priest who lost his voice, it's called, this, this little section from page 19. The priest who lost his voice. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Zechariah. You know the story in Luke chapter 1 where he's struck dumb. And uh, he says, imagine that you're in a similar situation. You get up to use your voice and you discover that you cannot speak. There's nothing there. All right, Andy. Okay, see, see you tomorrow, God willing. Oh, you're back, back to the second bit today. Lovely. All right, thank you. Good man, good man. Uh, so he says, imagine getting up uh, and you discover that you don't have your voice. You've got nothing to say. Uh, well, what are the reasons covered that this God, uh, who is holy and majestic and far above and beyond us in so many ways, is a God that you no longer dare to speak of? Is it because of a, a discovery of profound indwelling sin that needs to be confessed and forgiven? He says, with Zechariah, none of that is true. It was for a different reason. And uh, it, it's an interesting little kind of contemporary parable that he, he uses drawing from that story of Zechariah. Uh, the conclusion of it, uh, I, I think, is very helpful. Uh, he says, as God burst in on faithful old Zechariah, faithful Zechariah, as God burst in on him, he may also burst in on us with all the sermons God is calling us to preach, with all our variations on the song of deliverance that God is calling us to sing, 
for the distinctive sound of God speaking and also employ our own preaching voices. So I, I guess the, the, the final, in the final analysis what he's saying is an absolute dependence on God and faithfulness to him and his word is the key thing. Uh, and Schleifer's quite useful in an imaginative way on that. Now, that business of imagination and preaching is something we're going to uh, in class this morning. So uh, these are on your notes. I don't have these on the PowerPoint, but I've highlighted some of these as very important questions that Schleifer asks. Uh, I, I think that's right. There are a list of them there in the notes. Uh, just nod if that's right. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, so um, I've highlighted maybe a dozen of these or more. Uh, the first one I highlighted was what have your experiences of sermons and preachers taught you about what makes good or bad preaching? You know, sometimes we say, we, we, we come home and maybe in the car or over Sunday dinner, we say, was not great this morning. Uh, question is, what made it great? Why did you think it was great? Or you come home and say, I hadn't a clue about that man. You were dull. Uh, was it because you weren't in the right frame of mind? Or was it because he had the gift of, blessed gift of obscurity? Uh, what were the factors involved in this? Okay. Number two. In what ways or to what extent are you being overshadowed by what you have heard or seen in other preachers? In other words, you, you've, you've neglected to seek your own preaching signature, your own preaching voice. Uh, you're, you're, you're so focused on others and what they do that you want to be like them and you're, you're beating yourself up all the time because you're not like them. Uh, that's the second thing. Thirdly, uh, this is a good one. What are your idiosyncratic characteristics? If people knew you thought, felt, or acted in this way, would they think you were really weird? He likes this word weird. Um, I think there's a little bit of weirdness in all of us, you know. There, there, <laughs> there's something in all of us that are, they're idiosyncrasies, little habits we have. And... Uh, you know, if they're pointed out to us, we, we try and try and try to iron them out, to smooth them out and get rid of them. But they're very difficult to shift sometimes. And uh, sometimes you're even aware of them as you preach yourself and other times you're not aware that you're doing it. Fourth question, are you more of an extrovert or an introvert? Uh, there are psychological barometers for this uh, the, uh, Myers-Briggs uh, psychological test that some may be familiar with is a, a way of assessing whether you are an extrovert or an introvert. How does that relate to preaching? Well, I think that as you look at preachers, uh, you can see those who are hugely extrovert. We, we're going to have a ex couple of examples of this uh, in our uh, preaching videos uh, tomorrow. Uh, so... Um, we're going to look at some examples of extroverts, and then there, there are one or two who seem a lot more introverted. They're, they're more conversational in style, uh, certainly a lot more restrained. Um, which of those categories do you fit into, or are you somewhere in between? My guess is it's probably better to be somewhere in the spectrum in between the hugely extrovert and the hugely introverted. Okay, uh, fifthly, what are your favorite texts? This is a good question. What are your favorite texts and books of scripture? What texts do you find it easy to preach? What texts do you find it hard to preach? Now, herein lies a discipline, particularly for those who preach regularly, uh, because there are obvious go-to places, aren't there? So we might go to, well, you tell me. Give me examples of obvious go-to places for preachers. If you were asked to preach next Sunday, where would your mind go immediately? If you're thinking of a text, or a passage, or a book. Psalm 23, Psalm 23 obvious one. Anything? John 17. John 17, high priestly prayer. You're still looking at Stephen? Yeah. Oh, hi. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. St Stephen's saying it's sometimes helpful to be asked to preach on a particular passage. Mind you, that's a scary thing. Because, you, you know, if they're, if they're working their way through Second Chronicles or Leviticus or something, uh, uh, or, or Proverbs or something, you're, you're saying, ooh, this is tough stuff. Or uh, maybe they're in 1 Corinthians and, and they've just arrived at chapter 14. And here we are, a whole chapter on, on, on uh, speaking in tongues. And then you're into the middle of a major controversy. Ah. What you, what okay, that, that, now here's a helpful comment, guys, for, for the guys streaming. Sometimes good idea to follow your own reading if you've been asked to speak somewhere. What is it that has been occupying your mind devotionally? That's a very helpful suggestion. But aren't there obvious go-to places? And then there are places that we, we avoid, like that 1 Corinthians 14, like the book of Leviticus. Uh, I, I don't know, there, there will be others that you might say. But, uh, the letter of Jude is a is a tough place, especially a little bit in the middle. Or uh, when I started out, I well, I did Ephesians to begin with, and then uh, I obviously hadn't learned my lesson. I went to another church and I began in Galatians. And I thought, no, Galatians, great thinking. Luther, uh, uh, the letter to the Galatians, the gospel. This this is wonderful. It was all right till I got to the middle. And then I had Hagar and Sarah and uh, uh, typology. And I thought, what have I done? And uh, I struggled in the middle bit. Uh, the first bit, great. Last bit, fine. <laughs> it, was, it was the middle bit. It was tough. Uh, and so there are places that we just need to think carefully. Experienced preachers may be able to handle something of it uh, with the benefit of hindsight and experience and reflection a little bit more easily than preachers starting out. Sixthly, list the doctrines that most commonly occur in your reading and preaching. How well balanced is this list and what is missing? So there are some people who constantly think about pneumatology. It's all about the Holy Spirit. That's what they read. And so they preach on it all the time. But there's never anything really about the doctrine of Scripture itself or about the doctrine of God. What about the Trinity? Uh, what about uh, sanctification, uh, both in its definitive and progressive uh, aspects? So we don't get that stuff. We, we just got tunnel vision. So we've got to ask ourselves, what is it that, that, that rings my bell? Well, I've got to be careful I don't get onto a hobby horse. Uh, I've got to think about uh, giving people the whole counsel of God. Uh, what excites you about church life? And what causes you grief? You say, why are you asking that in relation to preaching? Because the things that excite you about church life are the things that you will mention a lot. And the things that cause you grief are the things that you'll use by way of illustration a lot. So uh, if you've got to be in your bonnet about uh, poor attendance at the prayer meeting, that will come up as an illustration all the time. Ad nauseum so that it becomes like a drumbeat. And uh, in my experience, scolding is counterproductive. I, I did a little bit of that in my early ministry and I discovered that it didn't work. The more I scolded, I got uh, um, a reaction in the first wee while. So if I scolded on a Sunday about attendance at something, uh, the next week attendance seemed to improve and I'd go home and say, ha, wonderful revival. And then the next week, or maybe the week after that, it kind of, you could see it dipping again back to where it was. So what's that saying? Is it saying the people of God are hugely unspiritual? No. Uh, it may be that there were other commitments that had interfered with this. But unless it is something that is in the heart, cajoling people will not produce the desired effect. That's been my experience in ministry. So it's got to come to the heart. So we're better to make our ministry and our preaching a ministry of encouragement rather than a browbeating. You know that there are some congregations and uh, they, they go out on a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening feeling beaten up. They don't go away feeling particularly encouraged. Now, is there a place for chastisement and rebuke? Of course. 
But if that is the strong, strongest element in our preaching, then we're, we're, we're missing out the balance. So uh, one of the Scottish worthies, I can't remember whether it was uh, McLaren or Rutherford, said, if I had my ministry again, I would encourage my people more. I would encourage my people more. Very important. What particular gifts do you bring to the task of preaching? What gifts, uh, this is maybe a better way to put it, uh, for, from Schlafer, what gifts do you wish you had? What skills do you want to develop? Um, so think about that for a moment. You know the way you preach, at least I assume you do. This module may help you to unearth it a wee bit better. But what, what are the gifts that you bring? And what, what do you wish you had? I, I've said, Alex knows this, and, and Nathaniel and, and, and Joyce way back a, a few years ago. I, I, I've often said to the undergraduate students, what I want to see in all of you is a little bit more oomph. I think it's spelled double O-M-P-H. It's a undiscernible kind of, well, no, it's discernible, but it's a, it's a vague kind of ethereal quality that produces animation. So I used to say if I could go to a chemist shop and buy a little vial of it and then a, a very fine injection needle and give some of you just a little jab, just a little, don't want you to become a circus clown, but just a little jab so that you would become more animated about the, the, the wonderful verities of God's word that you're proclaiming. Uh, and then I've occasionally, but not often, met a student who has so much of that that I want to give them a little chill pill so it brings them down slightly. But that's, it's usually the other way around. Now, uh, in other words, what gifts do you bring? Are you a person who stands like this, rigid? Is this fear of the congregation? Uh, has someone placed super glue on the ground? What, what's going on here? You never move. Uh, so we need a little bit of bodily movement. Uh, uh, certainly eye contact, some good hand gestures. These things are not the most important thing but they are not to be relegated to the category of insignificant. We need animation so that we can communicate effectively and communicate the eternal truths of what God has given us. So what particular gifts? To what kind of congregation, says Schlaver, do you dislike preaching? So some people say, oh, I would never speak to we, to we children. That, that's not me. What about the, the young people, the adolescents? Better with them? Okay. Middle-aged, elderly? Oh, the academic people. When I went to the second church that I pastored, there were some very academic people in the congregation, including Dr. Morris Dowling, uh, whose grasp of the original languages of Scripture was uh, probably as strong, if not better, than most people I've ever met. And so I knew that as I was preaching, Morris was sitting with either the Hebrew text in his hand, uh, if it was Old Testament, or the Greek. Uh, and and I, I was actually terrified about mentioning a Greek word or a Hebrew word. And for many months, uh, <laughs> I never mentioned the original languages. Now, be careful. You don't want to be parading your knowledge of Greek and Hebrew in the pulpit. The Greek word for this is... And then you actually give them the original Greek word. You don't need to do that. Uh, you just say, this word in the original language means. But make sure it's right. Somebody there will know. But don't be intimidated by academic folk, inverted commas. Because those folk also need the word of God. They need to be encouraged and challenged and sometimes rebuked. And uh, we're very easily intimidated by folk. It's a perception we have more than the perception they have. Uh, so uh, all of this is important. What about prayer? It's one of the categories oh, on the grid that you saw earlier. It's one of the categories there. How does praying inform your preaching? How do you pray about your preaching? What do you pray about it? And uh, of course that has to be uh, uh, a vitally important element. I was speaking at a, an online conference on Saturday morning uh, for Johnny Dowds in, in uh, Upney Baptist Church in London. I, I was originally meant to be there to do the thing and we did it online. And my, uh, my subject was the church. And uh, I, I spoke at one point about one of my points was about the church exists for the fellowship of God's people. 
And I talked about fellowship and all kinds of aspects and the word and preaching. And uh, then there was a Q&A at the end. And uh, one man uh, online said, I, I wondered what you thought about the role of preaching uh, in fellowship, uh, the role of prayer, sorry, in fellowship. What, what's, the, what's the role of prayer in fellowship? And he, it hit me like a ton of bricks. In all of my discussion, uh, presentation of fellowship, I never mentioned prayer once. I thought, what happened to me? Uh, you know, uh, did I get up the wrong side of the bed this morning? How, how could we relegate this to a place of no importance? I thanked the brother. I said, thank you very much for that because I need to go back and rework that again. Uh, how could I possibly forget that? What's prayer? It's a sense of our, an expression of our sense of dependence on God for all things. And so as we come to preach, who are we dependent upon? What are we dependent upon? Not our own resources, uh, oratorical ability, anything like that. We're dependent absolutely on God. It's John Piper's little prayer before he ascends the pulpit steps. He has a little acrostic, which has escaped me at the moment, but it's something like abtat, something like that. Admit is the very first letter, A. Admit. Admit what? That I'm not able to do this. In and of my, oh, I could do it, maybe get up and, and do it in my own strength, all right. But what would that accomplish? Admit that without God's help, I can't do this. Very important uh, first stage. So I find those questions, there are quite a few of them uh, in Schlafer, I find them quite perceptive and penetrating, and they certainly help me to reflect on my own preaching. Now, any questions or comments before we move to something a little different with regard to this? All happy? Okay, let's uh, press on. And we're going to have a look at this idea. Preaching is dead. And the person who gives expression to this is a guy called David Norrington. To preach or not to preach is the title of the book. It's in the library. And uh, I want to say as we begin to consider this that part of the task of this MA module is to enable and ensure that there is engagement with the body of knowledge and literature on the subject in hand. So what I want to do is to introduce you to two contributions on preaching. They come from different positions. Both are academics. Both have something to say with which we need to engage. And then I'm going to balance those views with a third. So we're looking at two academics and then we're going to balance their views with a third approach. So this is Norrington. In the conclusion of his book, Norrington says that the sermon tends to have harmful consequences. It frequently fails to instruct, it de-skills, it fosters an unhealthy dependence on the clergy. In these ways, the regular sermon not only fails to promote spiritual growth, but also intensifies the impoverishment of Christian life, which characterizes large areas of the church today. And so he says... To reevaluate and replace the sermon, the benefits resulting from this would surely be immense. Norrington's work is based on a survey of New Testament practice in the church, models and theories of learning as well, analysis of the language of proclamation or preaching in the New Testament, and concern for growth and development in the church. His conclusions, I hope this is not an overstatement, I don't think it is, his conclusions are radically anti-sermon. Radically anti-sermon. He says, the regular sermon is an inferior teaching method. The failure of the sermon is not necessarily related to the content of it or to the rhetorical skill of the preacher, uh, the content and manner of delivery are, in fact, he says, minor considerations or may be completely irrelevant. But some of the difficulties mentioned are raised by competent sermons, but these are very difficult to find. So I don't know where he's been or what particular uh, church he belongs to, if any. But anyway, let's look at the, the, the basic premises or planks of his argument here. So, um, 
I thought that was coming up. Here we go. Uh, the first is this creation of dependence upon the preacher. Uh, Norrington argues that the better the preaching, so he says there, there, there are good preachers and bad preachers, good communicators and bad communicators. His basic premise is get rid of the sermon. Uh, but he recognizes some people do it better than others. And he says if you do it better, it creates even more of a dependence upon you as a preacher. So it doesn't equip people for independent study. In fact, he argues, competent sermons may even be more damaging than incompetent ones because of this point, creating dependence on the preacher. Secondly, the problem of a different starting point and growth rate among the audience. So most preaching, he says, and most preachers don't take account of the fact that people are at different levels. They're coming from different backgrounds. Um, they may only grasp fragments at best. There is a wide ability range. Limited concentration spans increase the problem. So sermons, therefore, on the basis of this, says Norrington, are an unwise use of resources, and sometimes due to lack of rhetorical skill. Thirdly, the sermon fails to develop powers of thought and analytical skills so it's a, it's a monologue. There's no discussion, no participation, which are, of course, uh, as far as he's concerned, essential in the learning process. So nobody goes out having learned anything because they had no chance to discuss it or to be a agent. Speaking gift is seen to be the key, key gift. What does this do? It demoralizes the congregation. Got tremendous oratory. Look at the way he can speak. I could never do that. I'm no good. This is what he's saying. Uh, so there is a withering, to use his word, a withering of the use of gifts. Fifthly, the sermon is one-way communication. Well, this is like a, a, an expansion of a point he made previously. Little opportunity for, for preparatory reading. Did the preacher send an email to the whole congregation saying, uh, for Sunday morning, you might want to read this passage and then here are three textbooks that you should have a look at uh, before we come to the sermon today. No questions during it, no follow-up after it. This blunts curiosity and creates passivity. And he says, there is little evidence that sermons bring about change. Sermon. So one-way communication. Then an integral part of the system of control through its obtrusive presence in Christian God, members of the congregation and lessen the effects of clerical domination. I suspect this guy has had an issue with authority, I think, and maybe a bad experience at the hands of clergymen. I, I, I don't know, but there's something in the background here uh, that, that leads to this. And then the last one is, the sermon contributes to the poverty of Christian life the end product is social decay, a rise of unbelief, an increase in cults and non-Christian religions, depression and failure amongst Christians, a tarnish, and ultimately, he says, the wrath and judgment of God. So he's saying, keep doing this sermon stuff and God will judge you for it. Now, Norrington then says, at the end of his book, that he is not anti-church or anti-gospel. He is anti-sermon. Well, I guess it's fair to say he may not be especially irrational, but, and he is certainly radical. Uh, he needs to be taken seriously because his writing is influential in academic homiletical circles. So homiletics is the science of preaching. And in academic circles, people listen to Norrington. Now, I'm going to reflect on, on Norrington uh, in a minute or two, but let me, let me introduce Brueggemann then to you, first of all, before we reflect on that. We'll come back to it again. So the next one is Walter Brueggemann. This name might be a wee bit more familiar to you. Uh, Brueggemann is somebody who is a lecturer, teacher, preacher, um, he can write both at the academic level and the popular level. And so he's got this book entitled The Practice of Prophetic Imagination, 
Note the word imagination. That's uh, really the key thing uh, as far as he's concerned. So Brueggemann uh, is making a contribution to preaching communication in a postmodern world. Now, I suppose at this point, it might be a good thing, uh, before you look at that, um, does it distract you? Um, it might be a good thing just to have a quick definition of postmodernism. He, he's, he's making a contribution for preaching in the postmodern world. A quick definition of postmodernism, anybody? Nathaniel? Postmodernism? Okay. All right. No, come on. Who? Michael? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's basically postmodernism in a nutshell, uh, is that there are no absolute truths. Uh, so modernism, you see, was characterized by certainty. Uh, so Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. There, there's an absolute there. But postmodernism says uh, everything's kind of up for grabs. Your truth is your truth, but it just happens to differ from my truth. Both are equally legitimate. No absolutes. Is that, it's more complicated than that, but it's, uh, that, that's more or less it in a nutshell. So he, this guy Brueggemann, is writing into that postmodern context, making a contribution to preaching. So he says... Old modes, I've thrown these up in two blocks. Old modes of church absolutes are no longer trusted. He does not have a problem, he says, with theological absolutes, but with modes in which those absolutes are articulated. So he says, there are absolutes. So that's a contradiction of postmodernism, if you like. But the problem is, he says, the way in which those absolutes are articulated. So, for example, he says that most preaching and most Christianity is present, evangelicalism, read for that, is presented in ways that are patriarchal. It's male-dominated. It's hierarchical. There's an authority structure that is espoused. It's authoritarian. Uh, it doesn't give people liberty to object or to rebel. Uh, and it's monologic. In other words, there's no, not much dialogue involved here. It's just a monologue. You're told what to think or believe. Uh, so old modes of church absolutes no longer trusted. Second one there is the inadequacy of historical critical understanding of the biblical text. Whenever we come to look, we're going to look at a little video of Brueggemann, hopefully. And uh, uh, he gives some expression to the second point. So uh, historical criticism uh, is the fruit of the Enlightenment project. The Enlightenment uh, is a, a, a period and a movement. It's a period of history and it's a movement within history. Enlightenment, you think, well, obviously then there's light shining. Well, the light that's shining mightn't be a light that you and I might be especially comfortable with because it's a light that says uh, the, the text of Scripture uh, is something that's got to be analyzed and deconstructed and you've got to look at the history of it and criticize that in a way that is detrimental. Now, historical criticism might not say this in so many words, but we might, in reflection on it, say this, that it is this reflection on the history is critical uh, of the authority of this text and certainly of the inerrancy of this text, historical criticism. So he says, the inadequacy of historical critical understanding of the biblical text because it doesn't give enough credence to the use of imagination and creativity. So historical criticism is very logical, it's very analytical, and Brueggemann says we need to move beyond that to the use of creative imagination when we come to understanding the Bible and uh, especially communicating. And you'll see this in the little video clip that we're going to show. Thirdly, the new reality of pluralism is matched by an awareness 
if I'm getting this right, yes, of the polyvalence of the biblical text. This pluralism is matched by an emerging awareness of the polyvalence of the biblical text. In other words, there is more than one meaning in a text. And all these meanings, in fact, you could have multiple layers of meaning in a text, and all of these meanings may be legitimate and faithful at the same time. Now, our understanding, because we follow the Reformation on this, uh, classically, we, evangelical churches, conservative evangelical churches, and Irish Baptists are no exception to this, <clears throat> have followed the Reformation principles uh, of a simple, clear meaning in the text, which is linked to something, if I can put this on the board, uh, it's linked to something called authorial intention. In other words, the Bible writers wrote, sorry, that's not all that clear. That's because, what color is that? Green. I'm red, green, color blind, that's why. <laughs> I picked a green pen, help us. So, a thrill intention uh, is, is something that says the, the original writers wrote with an intent, with a purpose. Now, you know this is the case. So, uh, for example, we think about Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul writes this letter to the Romans not as a systematic theology for the benefit of generations to come. He wrote it as a letter to Christians in first century Rome and the church there. Now, is there material there upon which we could construct a systematic theology? Yes, in part. But it is first and foremost a letter with an intent my own personal conviction is the intent is a missionary intent in Romans. Because the apostle writes this letter to encourage the Roman Christians to stand with him in his grand and glorious purpose, which is God's purpose, of reaching the unknown world with the gospel. He wants to take the good news to places where Christ has never been heard. And in fact, he wants to go to Spain. Not for a package holiday. But he wants to take good news to Spain. Uh, and so he encourages the, the, these believers. And you can see this right at the end. Those chapters at the end of Romans, you know, are quite often neglected. But they, they, they bring a beautiful climax to the whole thing. Uh, and so there's an intent and a purpose. You cannot divorce the text of Scripture from authorial intent. Polyvalence in the biblical text. Well, I don't want to be so dogmatic as to say that you couldn't derive in some instances uh, another layer of meaning, another layer of application, maybe would be a better way to put it. Um, so that, that gives advice on a particular aspect of Christian living that you might want to apply in a whole lot of different ways meanings in the text it means that there are different applications in the text so we're saying something slightly different so uh, I think we'd want to drill down into that point that Brueggemann is making the next by a text it is Paul Ricoeur the philosopher who has done the most to show us that by text Ricoeur in his generation meant written discourse that is no longer in the control of the author and insists upon interpretation Interpretation uh, is to appropriate here and now the intention of the text. To appropriate here and now the intention of the text. But, says Ricoeur, such intention is derived not from the author of the text, but from the act of interpretation. And we want to say, no, no. Sorry. You're turning the whole thing in its head. We want to say that interpretation has to be something that is linked hugely to the intention of the author of the text. We don't want to say it's my interpretation of the text that counts. There are loads of people around us today who will interpret the Bible in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways. But the question that at the beginning, who wrote this text? Who did he write the text to? What was their situation? Whenever you begin to establish those things, then you will come to a proper interpretation of the text of scripture. 
And then there's a, a second batch of things that Brueggemann says. Uh, he says the dominant scripting of reality in our culture is rooted in the Enlightenment project. So you've got people like Sum, I think therefore I am, uh, uh, Hobbes, the right of the individual is his big premise. Uh, Jacques Rousseau, subjectivity and introspection. Interesting where all these are going. The Enlightenment project is nearly all about me. It's about self, it's about introspection, it's theories of self. Their writings in the Enlightenment period lead to autonomous individualism, resulting in, notice that phrase, I like this from Brueggemann, so there's some help to be found here as well. The triumph of the therapeutic. Now think about that. Isn't there a lot of preaching? I, I, I don't know whether this is true in our, in our churches so much, but I've heard a bit of it in our churches that our, our preaching is fulfilled. Do you lack satisfaction in your life? Fulfilled. Um, it's about how I feel, how I... Uh, stable person, am I happy? It's therapeutic. It's helping me to improve. And of course, <laughs> the essence of good biblical preaching is not therapeutic. Now, is there, is there a therapeutic element to it? Alex mentioned Psalm 23. Anything therapeutic there, Alex? Yeah. Um, also about to make one Okay, so for the, for the benefit of the guys streaming, Alex is saying, yes, there is something there that's therapeutic. Uh, the Lord leads his people through the valleys. Uh, he's present with them. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads and guides me. There's something therapeutic there. But the purpose of the Bible text is not to make us happy and fulfilled and maybe wealthy. That's prosperity gospel. But it's actually to do two things. It's to enable us to see our desperate need of a savior. And then uh, through faith in that savior to enter into a right relationship with God who will lead us ultimately on the path to heaven, to glory. What's that path going to be? Bible preachers, then we've got to inform our hearers that that path is going to be a rocky road sometimes. It's a narrow path. Jesus said so. It's not the broad road that's easy, unrestricted, that leads where? Destruction. It's the narrow road that's full of hills and ups and downs. It's constricted. It's narrow. It's tough. And uh, if you doubt any of that, then, then you haven't been reading the New Testament because the, the letters of the apostles uh, are, are so clear on this matter. We're, we're in a spiritual conflict Fight the good fight of faith. Put on the whole armor of God and so on. Why do we need to do that? Because this is a tough path that we've entered upon. The Christian life is no bed of roses. So the triumph of the therapeutic? Well, yes, but, and we hear this in preaching. Want to be happy and fulfilled? Yes. Uh, take up your cross. That's a hard road. So we want to, want to balance this idea of the therapeutic. We're not saying that there isn't comfort and co consolation and compassion in, in Scripture and, uh, and in preaching. There should be, but that's not the essence of what we're about. The next one is human transformation. Actic certitude, uh, says Brueggemann. Look at that one. Uh, but through uh, the playful scripting of an alternative reality. Now, um, uh, he's saying... Didactic certitude is, didactic is teaching from didasco, um, certitude, certainty. The words nearly tell you what they're about. So uh, teaching certainty. People want, people want absolutes, Brueggemann says. They want, they want certainties. But he said that's not the task of the preacher. The preacher needs to, through the use of creative imagination, Engage in the playful scripting of an alternative reality. There are realities that people are facing. Give them an alternative reality, which is the, rea the, the reality of the Bible. And do it playfully, imaginatively. Now, I want a bit of this imagination. I want a bit of this creativity because I, I'm not that person. I, I, 
if you say to me, what skills would you like to have? I'd say imagination and creativity. I'd like that. I don't have it. But is, is, is that what the task of the preacher is, to be creative and imaginative? I don't think so. But we'll, we'll look at this anyway uh, in our analysis of it. And then just before coffee, and I think it is 11, <clears throat> uh, the biblical text is the offer of an alternative script uh, which preaching should explore. Well, I think I said that earlier anyway. Uh, uh, the offer of an alternative script which preaching should explore. Now, uh, we're going to come then and look at uh, one or two more just to do, and then we'll look at the video clips uh, immediately after coffee. I'll try and get them running during coffee and uh, make sure that they're up. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, we will come back. I know maybe some of you are itching to make a comment about this or a question about Norrington and Brueggemann, but we will be doing that, so hold that thought. All right, thank you. So uh, if everybody wear their mask, please, and then go out. Obviously, you can't drink your coffee with a mask on, but yeah, you know that.
Sorry, Edwin Hamm.
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> okay, everybody, we're ready to start again. Uh, just had a little snag with our, our video material uh, because there's so many things happening with the internet. Uh, Nigel McQuillan is trying to download these for me at the minute and he'll bring them to me. Uh, David Luke, I think, is going to email the two guys who are streaming with the links so you could watch the two clips uh, for yourself uh, in your own computer. Uh, but hopefully that, will, hopefully that will work out. We're continuing on with Brueggemann then. This is his book on uh, the imagination. And uh, Hi, Stephen. Okay. Uh, if you go down, uh, maybe down into the, yeah, one of those two, that would be great. Stephen, you need to stay in that seat then for the rest of the module. Is that okay? Wow. Thank you. Good man. Uh, so we're back on Brueggemann again, and we're, we're responding uh, in a minute or two to some of this, but, but at the moment we're just really identifying uh, his main points. Uh, so the next one is preaching this script, preaching this alternative reality that Brueggemann refers to, is done through concrete, specific local texts that provide glimpses of an alternative world. Notice this, not through universal claims. Now the problem is that immediately does not resonate with us because we're coming uh, from a presupposition or a set of presuppositions in conservative evangelicalism which says there are universal claims. Those universal claims are based on the text of scripture that makes a, a claim, for example, uh, upon people's lives. It makes claims about our total depravity, for example, our need of a saviour uh, and uh, the exclusivity, if I can put it like that, uh, of Jesus Christ as the only mediator. So those are surely even uh, uh, universal claims that, that we want to use. So uh, from that point of view, we want to, I'm already uh, critiquing Brueggemann at this point, uh, as you can see. Now, I'm going to pause and let Nigel see if he can bring up these, these video clips. Well, the Brueggemann one anyway at this stage. And we don't need to stop the streaming. No, that's okay. You know. Yeah, let's just play it. Uh, we'll play the first clip at this stage of, of Brueggemann. And uh, then we'll, uh, in a very short space of time, play one by John Stott. Yeah, we're trying to... Oh, we might need some, some volume. Always need the technical expert here. So the guys at home, if you, David Lucas sent you links, I think. Uh, and if you want to watch this at the same time, so it's one by Brueggemann on the preaching task that you're looking for. It's about two minutes long. something. <laughs> We're getting there. At least we can see something. him. What's wrong with the volume? Ah. <laughs> Very simple. A lead not plugged in. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that came through the speaker somehow. Back to the beginning, and see. You yeah. have more for your money here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's not for me to give advice, but um, 
I heard a rabbi say not long ago, the Christian pastors have ruined the life of a rabbi because a rabbi is a scholar and a preacher. But Christian pastors are social workers and therapists and budget managers. And now he said people in his synagogue expect him to do that. I would think that uh, preachers, uh, I, I think it's exceedingly difficult, but I think preachers have to decide what the main tasks are and practice enormous self-discipline about not being drawn away to do other things that do not properly belong to the ministry of word and sacraments. You can't do that completely, but uh, I believe that many preachers um, finally get around to their sermon in their fatigue from everything else. And if imagination is the key to good preaching, you cannot be imaginative when you're exhausted. So I think it has to do with uh, ordering one's priorities for the sake of one's best energy. And that I think for many preachers, that means really deciding that this is the main task. And uh, if, you, if you want the congregation uh, to have missional energy and all of that, uh, preaching is a pivot point for all of us. And um, if, a, if a pastor decides that, then uh, the pastor is going to make more time for reading and the study and prayer are the disciplines uh, that, that cause the pastor to live to some extent in a different zone. And if we are to bring a word from elsewhere, then we have to live to some extent elsewhere. And I don't think that's very easy given the views, demands, and expectations Okay. Um, any immediate reaction to that that little clip? He seems a really nice guy. <laughs> yeah. He seems a really nice guy. Yes, he, he comes across kind of grandfatherly figure, doesn't he? Yeah, who might be somebody that you would like to go and visit. Okay. Um, what about what he said? Struck me that really there is it really reinforces the need for a team of elders. In a congregation where it's a sizable enough congregation to administer the gifts accordingly to the congregation and the world. Yep. Did some of that resonate with you, David? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh huh. Anybody else got a reflection? I have a very good friend who is a member of a very big church, not a Baptist church. And he once said, Yeah. That he has spent all his time in committees, his sermon will not be good. Yes. And it, it was obviously making the case that the guy spends too much time in committees and somebody else will be doing that work for him. Yes. It's, yeah. it's easy to say anyway, I think, but very hard to do, particularly in a small congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I think he's put his finger on something quite helpful here in terms of the business of prioritization. The, the primary function of the pastor teacher uh, is to do that to be a pastor teacher um, i think that there are two strong elements in that one is the ministry of the word uh, which of course will be absolutely central to what you do but the other side of it is <clears throat> the pastoring of god's people through the use of the word not just pastoring from the pulpit but they 
pastoring of people in individual settings and group settings and so on. And as David has rightly said, uh, it's about the, the, the ministry, the plurality of eldership. Uh, there, there is a, a role for the variety of gifts that you find there. Mind you, remember, of course, that the distinctive qualification of the elder is his ability to teach. And so whether that's in a pulpit way or in a private council type way, then that ability to teach must be present, otherwise you can't be an elder. Uh, so I think there's some good things in that particular clip. The one that we couldn't find then, I, I watched it uh, yesterday afternoon, was Brueggemann on Imagination. And uh, when we went to look for it, now we can't find it. So uh, this is uh, the frustration of some of this. Uh, uh, I guess I should have downloaded these. I thought it would only be a matter of just playing them from the internet, but there are too many things going on with our internet here in the building. What did he say? Uh, well, on imagination, he's talking about the scripting of a playful reality and that kind of stuff. And uh, it reflects in the, in the second clip on his estimation of the... Uh, the inspiration and authority of scripture. I think that's the issue. And, and the nub of my question then is, why, why, would you, why would you make the ministry of the word your priority if you don't actually hold that word in the highest possible esteem? Uh, so I think, I think there's, a, there's a disconnect between what he says in this little video clip, and that's why I wanted to show you the other one. But in your own time, if you have a, an opportunity, in fact, what I'll probably do this evening, uh, I, will <laughs> I will make it my business to find that again, download it and play it to you tomorrow, and hopefully that'll happen. Uh, but uh, I think there's a disconnect between the two video clips that's quite striking. Stephen. Did you know of what kind of that yesterday? Go into your history and look at the time and look at it, look at that way. Okay. I had the link to it, you see. I, I copied the link to myself. But Nigel can't download it from the link, apparently. So anyway, back to this again. These are his main points. Uh, preaching this script is done through concrete, specific, local texts, not through universal claims. Second, the work of preaching is an act of imagination, an offer of a different way of seeing, experiencing, and believing. A little bit of repetition in this, I think. And the book is a bit like that. It, it kind of goes around in circles a little bit. Preaching is the enactment of a drama not the delivery of certitude. He says there are people out there, that's what they want. They want certainties. But don't feel it's your business as a preacher to give them that. It's the enacting of a drama. Really? Uh, many of the people I pastored over uh, 22, 23 years were people who needed some certainty. They, they wanted to... If the, if the trumpet sounds an uncertain note, an Old Testament metaphor... Uh, then how will the people know? How will, they, how will they be warned, for example, the trumpet as the instrument of warning of an approaching army uh, in, in uh, the Old Testament prophets? So, so how would they know unless you sound that, that certain note? Uh, again, he says, the primary method of communication is telling a story and the subsequent living of that story. So there, there's an emphasis here on narrative as opposed to... Um, more expository didactic approaches so it's the unfolding of a story you see how this uh, connects to his espousal of imagination uh, and of creativity uh, the invitation of preaching is to abandon the existing script and enter a new script this is not the language of scripture you will appreciate i don't want to say that on that point he's saying something entirely different to the bible he's saying that people have a script so they're following a script in their lives. And what you're trying to do is to uh, invite them to uh, enter into the reality of a different script. Uh, my difficulty is, why not just use the language of the Bible? Why, why, why have you got to go into this scripting and alternative realities business? Uh, that's what sells his books, I guess. Uh, the offer of an alternative script invites the person to consider many alternative scripts the great pastoral fact among us is that the old givens of white male Western colonial advantage no longer hold. He says, it is my conviction that neither old liberal ideologies nor old conservative certitudes 
will now do. Ours is an awesome opportunity to see whether this text, this new script, this alternative reality can voice and offer life in a, a redescribed way that is credible and evocative of a new humanness rooted in holiness, practiced in neighborliness. In the language is the language is a language you kind of nearly need to get into. You've got to get your ear tuned to it because it's not the language of classical evangelical conservatism, certainly. And uh, it's certainly not the language of the New Testament in that regard. So he says, I believe the Old Testament leads to the New and to the Gospel of Christ. It does not, however, lead there directly, but only with immense interpretive agility. It does not moreover lead there singularly and necessarily in my judgment because it also leads to Judaism and to the synagogue with its parallel faith. So I'm going to say that again. Uh, I made an asterisk of this uh, in, in my notes. Do you have that little bit in your notes? I'm not sure you do. Maybe you do. The Old Testament leads to the new and to the gospel of Christ, but not directly only with immense interpretive agility. It does not, moreover, lead there singularly and necessarily because it also leads to Judaism and to the synagogue with its parallel faith. In other words, the Old Testament uh, could just as easily lead you to Judaism and the synagogue with a parallel faith. I, I want to drill down into that and say, well, hang on a second. Uh, does that mean you're saying that Judaism is of equal credibility and viability uh, as Christianity? Because our argument as evangelical Christians is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That all things are fulfilled in him. And that uh, as he walked on the road, with the two to, on the road to Emmaus, uh, he, he showed them from the scriptures, in other words, the Old Testament, everything concerning himself. Now, Judaism does not do that. And so as Dick Lucas said, the, the guys, undergrad guys will remember this, Dick Lucas says, what we need to do today is to go to the synagogue, knock on the door and say, when the rabbi opens it, we say to him, excuse me, please can we have our book back? It belongs to us. Absolutely right. The Old Testament is not a Jewish book. It's not a book of Judaism. It is part of our Christian heritage. It is a Christian book because it is fulfilled absolutely in the Lord Jesus. Now, some reflections then on Norrington and Brueggemann. First of all, on the preaching is dead. Uh, I'll throw up uh, a few reflections on it first. Uh, and again, you're following this on in your own uh, notes. And, and you've got these slides. The guys at home have got the, the slides as well. Uh, first of all, preaching is dead. Accusations that the sermon is a pagan adaptation suggest that the structure and content of the New Testament is also maybe both inappropriate or compromised. So if you say that the sermon, as Norrington says, is a pagan adaptation, it comes from uh, the rhetoric of the Greeks, for example. And uh, you know that for example, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he's writing in a Greek context where Sophia is the, the, the big concept. It's, it's the in thing, wisdom, the wisdom of the Greeks. And rhetorical skill was greatly valued. So if a man could speak publicly, oh, people thought that was fantastic. Adulation uh, was his due. Uh, so Norrington is saying that what's happened in the New Testament is that uh, some of these people like Paul and, and Peter on the day of Pentecost and others have simply taken that from uh, Greek rhetoric. But it wasn't something that was God's intention that it should be carried on by the Christian church today. It's a pagan adaptation. Now that suggests that the very structure and content of the New Testament is compromised or, or uh, inappropriate or both in my view. Second, no recognition or understanding of appropriate means of communication uh, in Norrington. In other words, um, who is it that is saying that 
the, the sermon is, an, is not an appropriate method of communication. Nowadays you hear this, sometimes you'll hear people say that. Um, uh, you've got to remember the young people, you, you can't speak for any more than 25 minutes, 20 minutes. Now I do say to, to our guys starting out, guys, 20 minutes, John Stott says in one place, and I believe in preaching, uh, preach as long as you like, as so long as it feels like 20 minutes. But that's John Stott, could have preached for 40 and it felt like 20. But young guys starting out need to learn, don't, don't give everything. Go, go 20 minutes and sit down. Uh, uh, and that's a good practice. But, but to suggest that, you know, we've got to remember the young people, they're watching uh, uh, lots of uh, social media stuff and it's all snappy and quick. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you can't communicate effectively with them unless you, you cut your sermon down. There was a, a, a minister in a locality where, where I was a pastor in one place, and he specialized in 10 minute sermons. And, and people waxed eloquent in praise of him for his 10 minute sermons. And I, I remember being at a wedding on one occasion, sitting beside a lady, he was all known to me, and uh, I said, she said, Oh, I'm a member of, she mentioned his church. And she said, without any uh, pressing from me at all, she said, uh, uh, he's wonderful. He's like, our minister's wonderful. You know, he, he only preaches for 10 minutes. This was doing the rounds of the country. He said, he only preaches for 10 minutes. I said, really? And uh, uh, she said, yes, because, because you don't need to go any longer than that. And uh, she said, you know, the, the sad thing is he, he, he's moving on to another church now. Or was he retiring? No, he was retiring. She said he's retiring, I'm going to be devastated to lose him. And she said, uh, we're getting a new man. I said, yes, I know the new man who's coming. <laughs> and the new man who was coming never preached for less than 30 minutes. Very good evangelical man from the Republic of Ireland. All this will remain nameless, okay? Because <laughs> somebody will be related to someone. Else. And, uh, and I said to her, yes, I know the man who's coming. Oh, she said, what's he like? And I said, he's great. I said, I think he's just fantastic. He'll be exactly the right thing for you. I said, oh, is that right? Why, why are you saying that? I said, well, one thing you will have to get used to, I said, you can say goodbye to 10 minute sermons. Really, she said. I said, yeah. How long would he preach? I said, on average, about 30 minutes, sometimes 35. Oh, she said, her mouth hit the table. Who's to say that preaching is an outmoded method of communication? Good preaching down through the ages has been the thing that has built the church of Jesus Christ. It's quite clear. Uh, one writer says in one place that um, times of revival of the church and of spirituality have been significant because of their connection to a revived interest in expository preaching. There's no question about this. Uh, and, and so I know we're in a generation now that is used to the visual, which is why we, you know, we, we, we buy into part, we buy into the best. The spoken word, the preached word is something that we can never relegate uh, as something that is, that is outmoded. Uh, I put this down, I think Norrington's attack is more against clericalism and forms of ecclesiology, in other words, a ecclesiastical authority than it is a, a rational. So sometimes you know whenever somebody in church um, professes to have a problem with something and the elders are listening to this, usually the pastor's first line of confrontation with it. And he gets it, you see, between the eyes, this person's got a problem. Quite often there's an underlying problem. The presenting problem is not always the problem. There may be something underlying it. And uh, although I don't have evidence to suggest this in Norrington's case, just reading his arguments, I suspect that he's had a problem uh, down the line uh, with ecclesiastical authority. Uh, and then the last one is, th this work is a classic modern preoccupation with results, achievement, and reason, leaving little room for the work. That, that, that's very obvious, I think. And if you're critiquing something like this, then try to write that in as academic a way as possible. Uh, it's a, a classic modern preoccupation. Modern there, um, 
well, maybe I should have put postmodern, uh, uh, preoccupation with results. So does the sermon achieve something? He says no. Uh, in fact, what it achieves is counterproductive. Leads to an unhealthy, uh, leads to a de-skilling of the congregation and so on. Um, so give me the evidence for that, I want to say. Show me the, show me the empirical evidence for preoccupied with that. Uh, with achievement, which he will measure according to his own rubric, and reason or logic, which I think is flawed throughout the book, leaving little room for the work of the Spirit. Very little mention here uh, of the, the work of the Holy Spirit, who is the author of Scripture and who is the one who uh, 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 empowers preaching. So we think about Peter on the day of Pentecost. He's preaching in the power of the Spirit. We think of Jesus entering into his ministry after the, uh, and he, he was not only led into the desert by the power of the Spirit, but he enters into his ministry in the power of the Spirit, Luke says. Uh, and so, not I, now I pause at that point and ask you, have you any comments you want to make about his, his reasoning? I, I think his alternative is <clears throat> his alternative. He's not saying he's anti-church. You see, he's not saying he's anti-gospel. Uh, he's anti-sermon. He doesn't think this is the way of communicating good news. So he says, "I've got good news, but what we need to do is to do that in a corporate community kind of way." So it's something that's going to be. Uh, now I'm bringing this word across from Brueggemann, it's not knowing. It's going to be expressed in community and neighbourliness. Uh, so far better, says Norrington, to have a discussion. Don't have these monologues. Have interaction, groups, discussion. There is a place for that. Uh, one of the most profitable meetings in most churches is a home group Bible study. Those can be enormously helpful. They can also be quite unhelpful, of course, if you've got... <clears throat> well, I sometimes think if you have the blind leading the blind, it's very difficult. That's a bit caustic. But um, you, need to, you need to choose your leaders carefully in home group Bible studies. And uh, uh, <clears throat> you need to make sure that they're tied into the centre. This is not a clerical domination argument. But I, I think that if the church is to be the church with proper leadership, then... It's a very wise thing to have an elder in each home group so that no home group can go off on its, on its own flight of fancy and become a kind of a little power base in itself that then destabilizes the, the whole church. I think that's just, that's just the nature of wisdom. Do we, do we know anything about his, his church background? No, I don't, you see. Uh, no, I don't. But I, I do suspect there have been issues there. There's two quotes that come to mind. One, one is, if, if you ask the question, what's good preaching? Have you never heard good preaching? Yeah. That's one quote that is, is ringing in the ears right now. Right? The other one was, uh, was an Arsley Sproul quote whenever he went to the piece on a passage of scripture. Yes. And whenever he <coughs> did that and presented it to his professor, his professor thought it was the most revolutionary thing he had ever, he'd ever seen. Mm. He encouraged him to have it published. Yeah. And Sproul said, that's ridiculous because if we publish it, it'll be, it'll be nothing but plagiarism because he was so familiar with other people who would communicate the scripture that, that way. And so those are, those are two things that are in my mind whenever I'm, I'm listening to what we're yeah, saying yeah. about freedom. Uh -huh. is where is his background? And, and Sorry, there's an Norrington. Sorry, there's an Norrington. Uh, yeah. what, what, has he been, what, has, what has he been exposed to preaching? You would potentially land in that, in that, in that place because you, 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 you have nothing other than a yeah, that's helpful, Stephen. For the benefit of the guys who are streaming, Stephen's saying that his background seems to be key here. We don't know a lot about his background. Kind of almost inevitably leads you into this place where you've got a good preaching. Yeah. Anything else? Is he even saved? <clears throat> but, uh, uh, but if you, the problem is if you, if you dispel preaching, how can you therefore claim principles and precepts of the New Testament. I mean, Jesus came as a preacher. This is the, uh, the emphasis of the Gospel of Mark, for example. And he came preaching. 
He preached saying, it's, it's like a little motif that runs throughout Mark's gospel. So Jesus is, if you like, the preacher par excellence, uh, on whose example the apostles follow. And so preaching lies at the very heart. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Preach the word. Uh, now, does the word preach there, the, the verb that is used there, does that mean do it in a pulpit, uh, in, a, in a pant? Now, whether had they pulpits in the first century church in Ephesus, who knows that? that <clears throat> let's not get bogged down on that. But uh, it seems to me that if they followed in the pattern of the synagogue practice, which, which was actually the pattern of the early churches because they had an Old Testament reading, uh, and they had prayers. They gradually, as the church developed, began to introduce a New Testament reading. And there was preaching, a reflection on that, an exposition of that, an explanation of it. I mean, you can find this in, the, uh, in, in Ezra, for example, uh, who proclaims the, the, the reading of the book of the law to, to the people. So it goes way back beyond Jesus uh, in the pages of the New Testament. So uh, uh, if you dismiss that, you're, you're running counter to so much that's in the, the Council of the Apostles in the New Testament. But in really, I, I always say this, David, I, I'm glad the Lord hasn't made me judge and jury. So is the man a Christian? It's very difficult to say, but I, the Lord knows these things. So that's uh, a little bit of response to Norrington. Then some responses to Brueggemann. We can throw these up before we move to our third balancing example. So the first is, there is encouragement in Brueggemann for preaching in the postmodern context. So remember what postmodernism is again, we have a kind of broad definition of that. Uh, it's, there are no absolutes. Your truth is... Uh, just as legitimate as my truths, but they're, they're equally valid. Um, uh, he encourages preaching. He doesn't say get rid of preaching, but what he says is make sure that preaching connects with a postmodern mindset. Don't, this is the difficulty, don't try to introduce certitude, which is where we depart from it. Okay, second thing. Prior theological assumptions on the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament hugely influenced the debate, for example, or that is to say the value of Midrashic uh, interpretation, Midrash uh, being a particular form of interpretation uh, that is used in, by some scholars in the New Testament. But he is theological on the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, except because if you think about his earlier comment that I highlighted and read twice, the Old Testament leads to the New and the Gospel of Christ, yes, but not directly, only with immense interpretive agility. No, it leads directly there. It's clear, plain, obvious. Isaiah stands centuries before the events of the cross as if he's at the foot of the cross. That's just the most, loads of other examples of this. Some of those examples we have in our nativity readings at Christmas. So there's a direct line from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we do not believe that it leads to Judaism and the synagogue. We want to say that there's actually a sharp division in the road. Because if you read the book of Acts and how the apostles went into the synagogue as was their custom, which they did in their, their missionary journeys. Apostle Paul, his missionary journey, proclaimed to them what? He proclaimed to them Jesus, his death and resurrection. Uh, in some places there were those who believed, Luke's little phrase, and in other places they wanted to kill him. Probably predominantly more that than those who believed. But he went right into the heartland of Judaism, into the synagogue, into their special place, and proclaimed what? The fulfillment of the Old Testament and the New in the person of Jesus. So it doesn't lead directly to Judaism. It contradicts Judaism at a huge number of levels. Uh, I, I would point you in this connection, actually, to Acts chapter 8. 
Isn't that the chapter on the martyrdom of Stephen? First martyr. Read Stephen's sermon to those who were about to stone him. Read that sermon. He demolishes the great pillars of Judaism. Sorry if that sounds a bit like a, a, a comment you might apply to, to Islam. Uh, but he demolishes the, the, the pillars of Judaism, which are land, law, and temple. Those three. Land. God has promised us a land. And he will bring us into it. Uh, law. Where we've got the Torah. And you talk to the Orthodox guys today in Jerusalem uh, with the, the kind of, as I call them, pigtails down the side and the black hats. Talk, talk to them. The Torah. Uh, and the temple what are they waiting for? they're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt but Jesus fulfills them all and we've got to go to those guys and say uh, what you're waiting for has already come Jesus has come and he's coming again and uh, proclaim to them Jesus, his death and resurrection and imminent return uh, so we want to say with, to Brueggemann Sorry, we don't accept your theological... Well, I've written the word assumptions here. Presuppositions, maybe, is a better way to put it. Now, there is some helpful insight. Notice that uh, sixth bullet point, whatever it is. Some helpful insight into the role of reimagining. This is what good preaching has been doing for centuries. Even in the use of... So what I want to be saying to master's students at the Irish Baptist College, as we say to all our undergraduates... Deal in certainty, not uncertainty. Don't give the impression in the pulpit that you, you, you're not really sure about these things. Uh, there, there are three views on this matter. Let now, at the end of your presentation of the three views, you say, and so uh, uh, as is good to, leave, uh, to make up your own mind about these matters. No. Deal in certainty. Show people that you're a man of conviction that you've got something that's solid that you depend upon. But do it imaginatively. Don't do it so that people are bored. Some people preach their sermons. It's a bit like a systematic theology textbook. Uh, is it any wonder that people uh, do it with imagination? Connect with people in the postmodern world. Who are you preaching to? Here's a farmer. At this time of year, he's been thinking about the harvest. Have you got an illustration that might connect with this guy? The Bible's full of horticultural analogies and illustrations. Why on earth would you not use them? Why on earth, oh, don't get me started on uh, why some churches don't have good harvest services. Come on, I know in the pandemic we're kind of stuck on this at the minute. We can't have our harvest supper with apple tart and fresh cream. But, uh, uh, and that's a great source of annoyance to me. I love harvest. Wonderful opportunity to preach on creation doctrine of creation, uh, and to bring in people into the church and have an evangelistic uh, uh, approach to it. Tremendous. I love that at this time of year. Um, he, here's a mother. She's having trouble controlling a couple of wee nippers who are sitting beside her. Bible have anything to say to her? Of course. Uh, about children and, and motherhood and uh, uh, a wife more precious than rubies. The wise man says in the Old Testament. Um, now you're not going to do that every sermon, obviously. But the people in their different situations. Here, here's somebody who's uh, struggling with their uh, the the pressure of work. Um, have you anything to say to them? You're speaking to real people, not holograms. So what we've got to do is deal with certainty, but do it imaginatively. Try to think yourself into the situation uh, of the people to whom you're speaking. So that's the next one. The theology that is preached is not merely an enlightenment product. So theological categories emerge from our preaching the text of scripture. Theological categories. Which, by the way, actually serve... There's a mutual relationship between the text and our theology. Uh, our theology emerges from the text. It has to come from biblical theology, from the Bible. But at the same time, our theological categories that have come from there in the first place have a controlling influence on our preaching. 
so that we don't go off into a flight of fancy or into a, a dangerous, erroneous kind of idea, for example, about, oh, let me pick one, uh, the eternal security of the saints. So, from Scripture, we, we've derived this doctrine about eternal security, or if you prefer, the perseverance of the saints. We've derived a, a, a structured doctrine from the texts of Scripture and that. When we come to a text that seems to suggest a contradiction of that doctrine, like a passage, one of the passages in Hebrews, there are tricky little passages in Hebrews, you know this, uh, where it says it is impossible for those who have been enlightened if they return to their former way uh, to be brought again to repentance. And we're, you know, the, the, the people down there read this passage, people say, oh, that means I'm not a Christian. Or does it? I'm not sure what to think. The preacher comes to this passage. What controls his understanding of that? Well, the clear understands the obscure. The prominent uh, 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 interprets that which is in a corner. Look at the predominance of text in this whole area. Look at the clear text. What's the theological structure that you've, you, you've assembled on the basis of those clear and obvious texts? No one shall pluck them out of my hand. Uh, those whom the Father has given me will come to me. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Absolutely clear. Well, on the basis of those texts, we've assembled a theological position on the doctrine of perseverance and eternal security of the saints. That will control and guide our understanding of the Hebrews text. Those ones that seem a bit allegedly contradictory. Now, you've got to do some good digging and exegetical work on passages like that. But what, what I want to say is, elements of theology that is preached are not merely enlightenment products. Uh, they're not just to do with historical criticism, which was an enlightenment product, nor are they to do with things like self-analysis. So Rousseau and John Locke and, and, and so on. It's not all about me. It's about God and his word. And, uh, and um, remember we said when we were talking about the Enlightenment, an individualistic therapeutic product. Uh, that's, that's the big danger of Western society today, that we think so individualistically. But we don't think sufficiently in terms of community. So it's the church, you say. It's not all about me. It's about us. I think that shows itself, for example, uh, just a quick aside, it shows itself, for example, at the Lord's table, where it does say, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and, and drink of this cup. But it also says uh, that we are to discern the body. Some writers interpret that as the body of Christ on the cross. I suspect that's actually a bit of a Roman Catholic idea. Of course, they've got crucifixes all over the place. So thinking about the body at the Lord's Supper, what body is being referred to? I think that what's being referred to there is the body of the church. The body of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ. It means that as I sit looking across the aisle, or in my our socially distanced thing at the minute, looking two meters away at the person over there, I, I, I've got to be thinking, I, how does the way I behave and speak and think and live <clears throat> affect this person, this brother, this sister in the church? How does it affect them? How do the way they live and think and breathe affect me? So it's a, it's a body analogy there. Uh, so uh, I, I want to say we're, we're, we're not simply following an enlightenment uh, agenda here. Our theological categories can be done imaginatively, uh, uh, but... Uh, emerge from the text of Scripture. Now, any uh, any further reflections on Brueggemann that you, before we move to my third example? All happy? Okay, let's go then to my third balancing example. Uh, and this is John Stott's book, which is this one, Between Two Worlds, or uh, as the other title is, I Believe in Preaching. Uh, so I've given this the title, Preaching is Alive, 
So we've got we've had Norrington who says preaching is dead, and we've had Brueggemann who says, well, yes, preaching is significant, uh, uh, but it has to be done creatively and with imagination. We've taken some good things from him. We've also uh, introduced some cr uh, critical comments on Brueggemann, and then we come to John Stott. And at this point, I'm going to try to show you this little video from Stott. So the guys online. Uh, if you can find that link that David Luke sent, it's a little six, seven minute video by Stott. It's an interview that was conducted with him about the task of preaching. So here goes, let's hope. Nigel is in the building if we're stuck. What do you believe is the state of preaching today? Miserable, <laughs> abysmal. Well, let me begin by saying that I'm an unrepentant believer in the power of the pulpit. I believe in preaching. I know it's regarded by many people as an outmoded form of communication, as what some of us called uh, an echo from an abandoned past. Who wants to listen to sermons nowadays? You know, people are drugged by television. They are <clears throat> hostile to authority. They are weary and wary of words. And they don't want to listen to sermons. But I believe that it's possible to recapture the sermon as an authentic means of communication today. There is something unique about preaching when you have a living person uh, facing living people. As hopefully a spirit-filled preacher addressing spirit-filled people that there is a chemistry, there is, a, uh, there is something that happens that isn't, doesn't happen on television or even on other forms of communication. So I believe that there is something about preaching that is unique and I want to see it captured. So why is it so rare today? That is biblical preaching. Preaching to me must be, maybe not expository in the sense of going through a long a passage of scripture and giving a running commentary on it. I don't mean that. But that every sermon must be a biblical exposition. It must uh, wrestle with a passage of scripture, uh, a verse, a paragraph. So the reason why biblical preaching is so important is that it is the uh, exposition of the word of God. And it is the word of God that needs to come to people. It's the word of God that challenges people and that matures the people of God. As Jesus said, human beings don't live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And if that's true of individuals, it's equally true of churches. Churches live and grow and flourish by the word of God, and they languish and die without it. So we must bring the word of God to the people of God if the people of God are to grow into maturity in Christ. So why don't more people do it? Well, I know why I'm tempted not to do it. It's laziness. It is because there is no form of preaching that is more demanding on one's time and energies than biblical exposition because we have to wrestle at great length with the text until we are as sure as we can be that we've understood it. And then we have to go on wrestling, not only with the text, but with the application of the text of the modern world. So I've often called preaching uh, relating the ancient text to the modern world. And that means study on both sides of the cultural divide. And that's very taxing, very demanding. And of course, pastors, all of us are very busy people, and we need to find something that perhaps we can uh, give up. Preaching is often the first thing. Do you have any recommendations for young preachers or preachers who want to excel? Well, the first thing young preachers need in going out to the task is to be convinced of its necessity, to be convinced of the power and the relevance of biblical preaching. Only that will motivate them to do it. The second thing I would want to say to them is give yourself time. It's not possible to be a biblical preacher 
if you skip the time. So what you need to do once you've chosen your text, and the process of choosing the text is another question, but once you know what your text is, then you need to read it, and reread it, and re-read, re-read it, and go on turning it over and over and over in your mind, meditating on it, you know. Asking yourself two questions. One, what does it mean? And two, what does it say? What does it mean is its meaning. And what it does say is what it did say. And what it did say is what it does say. The meaning of the text does not change with the changing years. It remains the same. The meaning of a text is established by the author of the text. A text means what its author meant. And then, having asked what does it mean, the second question is what does it say? That is, we turn from its meaning to its message. And there we have to think about our congregation. Who are we going to preach to next Sunday? Are they young married couples? Are they teenagers? Are they elderly people who've retired? We try and envisage, visualize in our mind who these people are. And then comes the excitement of relating what, what it means to what it says, or the ancient meaning to the modern message. How do you choose a text? Well, there are several different ways in which to choose a text. The best one, I believe, is that we engage, maybe not all the time, but very often, in expounding a whole book of the Bible, or maybe the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, or the Upper Room Discourse, or the Epistle to the Philippians, or the Book of Jonah, or whatever. So if we are expounding a whole book, and maybe taking 20 or 30 Sundays over it, then our text is given us. We know what it was last week, and we know what it's going to be this week. It's the next part of, that's the most healthy way in which to decide on a text. The second one, I suppose, is the season of the year. Uh, even if uh, churches are not liturgical churches, many of them will observe, they'll observe Christmas and Good Friday and Easter Day and Ascension Day and Pentecost uh, and so on. That's the second way. And the third way, I think, is that we need to preach out of our own experience. And while we're reading and studying the Bible every day, and ideas for sermons come to us while we're reading, I think it is a good idea to allow one's mind to follow. We all of us have momentary flashes of inspiration. Sometimes at the most awkward moments, when somebody else is speaking, or on the top of a bus, or in the middle of the night. And I always say, seize these moments of inspiration. They're all too rare. But when we get them, and God seems to be speaking to us, then I want to get out of bed, and get out the notepad I keep at the side of my bed always, and write down. Sometimes I prepare sermons in my dreams. My secretary is always very amused with this. And my study assistant, but I do. Sometimes while I'm dreaming, the sermon takes shape, you know. And then, of course, I write it down immediately. I've woken up. So seize the moment of inspiration. No. Okay, uh, let me put that light up again a wee bit. It's better. Now, any quick reaction to that little video clip? It's not on the task of preaching. Any comments? Encouraging for preachers? Yes, I'm getting a few nods. Um, Anything that you'd never heard before? Probably not. I think most of the comments that were made are things that we would heard before. The only thing I, I'd never heard before is preparing a sermon in your dream or, or, or getting a, a, a message in your dreams. Um, I have to say my dreams are so irrational and bizarre, I certainly would never want to be preaching anything connected to them. 
Uh, my dreams are hugely detailed, but they're usually quite bizarre. Uh, Freud would have had a field day with me. Uh, but I think the thing that comes across to me in this little video clip, and this is our, remember what I said, this is our balancing third category, our example. Norrington, the sermon is dead, Brueggemann. The sermon is legitimate, but it, it interprets a different reality. The language that's being used is very different. Stock takes us back to a classical estimation of preaching and uh, the, the authority that comes across in him even when he's not preaching. This, the authority that is there right from the beginning of this interview is a God-given authority, can I say? Uh, it's not a domineering authority or a, a, a pompous authority or an authority that decries all other wisdom, but there's something in this that, that really speaks to us, uh, I think, very clearly. So preaching is alive. Stott says preaching is indispensable to Christianity. Christianity is, in its very essence, a religion of the Word of God. God is a speaking God through his prophets, through his Son, through his Spirit. It is God's speech that makes our speech necessary. So we need to speak what he has spoken. This is unique to Christianity. Christian preachers are not merely expositors of an ancient tradition, but they are heralds, communicators of good news from God. So uh, John Stott traces the development of preaching in the first instance in the church, from the ministry of Jesus through the infant and early churches to the Reformation as a high point. I suppose it would be legitimate to say that the Reformation was a recapturing of the importance of preaching from the, the days of the infant church. And then he, he traces it on. This is in, the, in this book, I believe, in preaching or between two worlds. He traces it on through the age of the Puritans, the evangelical revivals to the present day, which he identifies as a low ebb of preaching. Therefore, his opening words were abysmal. Now, I was going to ask you, do you think that that's entirely justified in the current age? That the state of preaching today is abysmal? What do you think? I think it's polarized. Okay, what do you mean by polarized, Stephen? I think it can either be very, very poor or very, very good. Okay. There's less in between. It's either very poor or very good, you're saying. Yeah, okay. Um, is it, does it depend where you live? Does it depend on your geography a bit? Are there any indicators, let me put it another way, any indicators that good preaching may have gone through something of a, how shall I put it, mini revival? What would you say? Yes. Why? You see, you see it in pulpits, you see it in the appetite of those who, who preach. You see it in, in what's being published in terms of books that are steering people towards good preaching. I think even some of the names that you've mentioned already today. Yes. Yeah. So that they're in their own preaching, following that, that pattern. So All right. So we so we see it in in some churches this mini revival. We see it in some preachers. We see it in an appetite in congregations, mm -hmm. to some degree. Yes, I think there are movements that that have made an impact on this. You want to say, Michael? Yeah. I think in the circles that most of us move, that's probably true. Yeah. Yes, in our I, I, circle, yeah. yeah I mean, obviously, the proclamation trust is going into the end. Yes, and, yes. And there are other, you know, the reform guys in the states that I like to listen to, the guys like Matt Gordon and so on. They were quite mm -hmm. I wonder in the wider. When my son-in-law is an Anglican, uh, pure. Yes. And certainly within the.
Berkeley. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. So Michael Michael is saying that there there are some obvious examples of this in the Ministry of the Proclamation Trust, for example. Uh, some of the American uh, uh, influences, like Gospel Coalition Together for the Gospel, preaching conferences, theology conferences. Um, Denominationally, it's probably difficult to just put your finger on exactly where people are. I think it's maybe true to say that in the independent free churches, the, the level of preaching is maybe stronger. Uh, in Ireland, for example, in Presbyterian churches, there are many more evangelicals today than there were when I sat where you sit uh, many years ago many more evangelicals who are preaching very well. Anglicanism is a wee bit more of a, a mix. I think there are some very fine exemplars in Anglicanism, and then there's a lot of stuff that's kind of up and down, middle of the road, and some stuff not very good at all. So it's, it's a bit patchy, you know, uh, but I think there is some evidence to suggest that there has been, even through the production of good uh, books on preaching, like Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, Preachers and Preaching, John Stott's book, and so on. Uh, the, even through the influence of that, there, there has been a mini-revival. I wouldn't put it any more strongly than that. Now, Stott, therefore, looks at the development of preaching. Secondly, he looks at contemporary objections to preaching. Uh, and in this, he identifies, for example, the anti-authority mood the old order is giving place to a new in which all accepted authorities in family, school, state and church are being challenged. Now, it is clear that Christians stand opposed to false authorities, to authoritarianism, but they stand in the vanguard of those who want to advance true authority, which promotes human freedom. And so it is under the yoke of Christ that we find that freedom. We find rest, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, not in the discarding of that yoke. Stock encourages the turn to the listener. Uh, if that means sermons are relevant, but not in the sense that any word of authority is denied. And also the notion of dialogue in sermons, in that the true sermon is not the monologue it may appear, he says, but rather a silent dialogue occurs in which questions are provoked in the mind of the hearer and answered by the preacher in his message. Now, I won't take time to develop that. Uh, if you want to make a note of the page, I think in your notes it says start page 62 forwards. It should say 60. So if you go to 62, you'll be thinking, oh, where is he? Uh, I think from page 60 forwards in this book, which I think is a go-to book, uh, it would be one of those books, if I wanted a book on preaching, I'd, I'd get this. And I'd definitely get Michael Quick's book as well. Uh, and a few other things that we'll refer to as we go along. So he talks about the anti-authoritarian mood. Uh, anti-authority mood, rather. He talks about the cybernetics revolution. Referring to radical changes in communication. He says, has the box in the corner replaced the pulpit in the church? Um, I think that that may be so. Now, the box, he means the television. I know uh, young people, my daughter doesn't watch TV, uh, so they, they use their laptops for uh, Netflix or whatever it is they're doing. Um, uh, but the box, and of course, some other form of entertainment has it replaced the pulpit. Stott highlights the deleterious tendencies of television. He's a man of his age, 1960s, 70s. Um, uh, the, the tendencies of television, it tends to make people, look at these, physically lazy, intellectually uncritical, just let it wash over you, emotionally insensitive, psychologically confused, morally disordered. The more you watch stuff, 
the more it desensitizes you if there's violence in it, if there's bad language in it, sexual content, the more you, you soak yourself in this material, there's a desensitization, Stott argues, that occurs, which he argues has some scientific basis. Now I'm aware that scientists differ and, uh, I was going to say, patients die. That's, you know, doctors differ and patients die. Uh, scientists can come to different conclusions about this, but there is some evidence to suggest that. Now, trying to compete with the entertainment world is a tall order. You know this. The, the entertainment moguls have got it cracked. How can I ever compete in my little corner, in my church with that? So people say, well, what you're doing in the church is dull and drab and dowdy and slow and monotonous. You can't compete in the television age. However, what is unique in preaching is that God is present, says Stott, through word and sacrament, and nothing can take the place of that. But most debilitating of all, he puts his finger on this, is the church's loss of confidence in the gospel. The, the pulpit of the present day, he argues, has no clear, ringing, and definite message. That's what we said earlier in our response to, uh, to Brueggemann. Stott quotes Campbell Morgan. I love this quotation. Uh, a man has a perfect right to proclaim a theory of any sort or to discuss his doubts, but that is not preaching. Give me the benefit of your convictions if you have any. Keep your doubts to yourself. I have enough of my own, said the philosopher Gotha. So don't parade your doubts in the pulpit if you've got those doubts. Give me conviction. Help me to see that there are eternal verities. It's like Alistair Begg's uh, uh, going to a church. You, you've seen the little video clip of Beg. You know, uh, the guy says, how, do you, how are you all feeling? He bounces onto the platform. How are you all feeling? Beg says, you don't want to know how I feel. What a horrible morning. Let me tell you about it. And he goes into all this stuff. He says, no, give me eternal verities. Give me something that brings me right into a conscious sense of the presence of God. Not, notice what he says. Uh, watch that clip carefully. He doesn't say, bring me into the presence of God. No, I don't have the power to do that. Nor do you. Bring people into the presence of God. God is everywhere. Let's remind ourselves. God's presence is universal. So it's not that we are somehow through our platform of praise and prayer and whatever else are bringing our congregation trailing behind us into the presence of God. We're in his presence. Luther lives his life, remember, he says, coram Deo, to use the Latin phrase, in the presence of God. He lives his life. So what are we doing? We're trying to make people aware of the felt sense of the presence of God. Therefore, how do we do that? Well, we don't start by asking them how they feel. We, we start by making a statement from the word. Uh, singing what Freddie McLaughlin calls a big hitter of a psalm or a hymn. Uh, not a quiet, reflective, meditative piece, I think, to begin with, but a, a, a piece that, that's uh, resounding and, and, and full of objective praise of God that will lift us and make us feel God is here. That, that, that's what we need at the beginning. And then when we begin to appreciate that reality, we start to appreciate our own fallenness and sinfulness, which of course will be expressed uh, in our confession that ought to be a, um, a strong element of, uh, of our prayer life. Did you read recently, by the way, that confessional boxes are falling increasingly into disuse in Roman Catholicism? I came across this the other day somewhere online uh, uh, where uh, they were interviewing a priest who said that uh, confession boxes, you know, are, are falling into serious disuse. People are not using them now. Why is this? Is it because of a lack of, is it because of the pandemic? I'm not so sure about that. Or, or is it because of a lack of confidence in the whole process? Uh, or is it because the priests themselves are not convinced they have any part to do anything in that box with anybody? And of course, we don't believe in it anyway. We believe in confession, but not private auricular confession, which is what's happening there. Auricular in the year, private confession into the year to an individual. We go straight to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, our, our intermediary. So 
uh, Campbell Morgan's statement is great. Third, theological foundations for, uh, for preaching. Conviction about God, about the Bible, about the church, about the pastorate, about preaching itself. These things are crucial. What about the question of meaning, says Stott? Uh, to discover the text's meaning is of purely academic interest unless we go on to discern its message. Now, isn't that what he said in the interview? It's interesting, he's got this in his head. So, what's the meaning and what does it say? The meaning is where you begin uh, and then you discern its message for today. But to search for its contemporary message without first wrestling with its original meaning is to attempt a forbidden shortcut. It's a good comment. Uh, and then, fifthly, presence of God. Uh, the challenge that we preach in the sight and hearing of God. Jeremiah did so. Uh, the Apostle Paul did so. Second Corinthians 2.17. Uh, so uh, all of that, I think, uh, you will find to be something uh, that is greatly encouraging. Now, any comments you want to make about, about Stott before we go to something else? Any questions? What about that business of contemporizing uh, in the face of the cybernetics revolution? Anybody would like to make a comment about that? Well, we can't, the cybernetics revolution is, is just all kinds of media. Folk are soaked in this. They live their lives in the context of this. It's difficult even for them to turn their phone off when they come to church. In case somebody texts them or they might miss a WhatsApp call or something. Um, I, what's your, what's your, your feeling? Can we employ this for the sake of the gospel? Are there... Are there ways in which we want to contradict that agenda? What, what, what do you think? Well, some of you younger guys, I mean, you're, you're much more adept in all of this than an oldie like me. Do I sound like a dinosaur when I talk like that? You need to tell me. See, I'm seeking critique and evaluation here. Are we talking pragmatism, you say? Right, explain. There's always been the, the struggle, even among the best of us, with how far do you go? Um, almost to pick on you to the extent of you don't do this for not listening or not being interested, and particularly from really a Christian viewpoint, if you're a Christian listening, as a pastor, you're saying, well, if you're here this morning, if the word itself doesn't why should I even try and dress it up to make it nice for you? Mm. Um, and we can almost go to that extreme with, mm. with media, as good as it, as it can be. Um, I don't know if I were as maybe from where we were on when I was home listening. You know, your relationship with God ultimately is when, when there's no one else around, nothing is listening, but you have the word, and yeah. that itself it should accept you. Yes. Yeah, so the question of pragmatism, uh, how far we go in accommodation, and then at the other end of that extreme, there are people who don't accommodate at all. They almost try to live their lives divorced from this reality, which it is, the reality of the, this revolution. So uh, do you think the church has gone too far down this road? Or have we not gone far enough in employing the best of it? Can I ask you that in your church, think of your own individual church, um, in the preaching, because we're really talking about the preaching here, in the preaching, does your pastor or you, if you are the preacher, employ... Uh, multimedia resources in the, in the preaching or never or only very rarely personally I use it less now than I used to ok um, probably would have used slides more in the past particularly with young people um, I'm not sure if that was a crutch for me or for them yeah
Okay. Now, Stephen is saying that he uses uh, PowerPoint slides you're thinking of here uh, less now than you used to. Is there a reason why you're saying now you're just saying to people, just make sure you have your Bible open? Uh, what's the reason? Did you feel it was... Yes. And then he had that, that, that connection and get them to not to listen to what Annie's saying, but to listen to what, what the passage is saying. So in a sense you were were you feeling that it kind of disconnected a wee bit from the text of it? So my, so my, my, my thirteen year old daughter was sitting beside me yes. yesterday morning trying to take notes on her on her iPad. Now, as long as she's taking notes I don't mind whether she writes it down or sees it. Aye. Mm -hmm. So it's trying. So it's trying to get a blend of both. I think. I think it, it can be used in advance of. So you know, read, you know, looking at something beforehand or a message going out that steers you towards the passage that's going to be preached yes. on. Yes. Yes. So there's a, a thought in their mind. And yep. Mm. That's all helpful. Mm. It's, what is it? What is it? The the central event, whatever we read, which is the opening. So for you, the opening of the Word of God, the text of Scripture is the key thing. We may use iPad or whatever other means to make notes as long as uh, we're not kind of doing this with the Bible, setting it out of the way. It's all electronic. So I guess in her defense, she might argue this, she could have the text of Scripture open in one column and, and her notes in the other. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yes, David. Depending on, on the, the style of um, communication that's coming out, if it's a young guy or a new guy in the pulpit, to have a PowerPoint up which focuses on the building of the message, or the key points of the message, would yeah. be very helpful for him as well as the congregation yeah. to grasp where this is going and it's, uh. what it's leading to, whereas he may be new and just keep him from fumbling with a ball, just to keep him yeah. focused. Yeah, that's a good point. David's saying uh, to have something visual, even throughout the sermon, to help you with the flow, helps the preacher as well as the congregation. So uh, uh, your analogy is the, uh, I don't want to say, is that a Gaelic analogy, the fumbling with the ball? R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul, okay. I thought maybe it was coming from, uh, from uh, Cork itself. <laughs> But uh, to stop you fumbling with the ball, losing track of where you're going. One of the questions we ask always in our critique at sermon class uh, is the whole business of direction. Where was it going? Was there an obvious progression in the flow of thought in the sermon? And then our students uh, uh, seek to evaluate that following sermon class. And I, I think that's important. It keeps us on track, uh, apart from just the congregation. Alex? Yeah. We're going to write that down and take that away. And that takes a lot of work from us because you need to think about it. You need to think about what words you're going to use. But I think it's helpful in the end for them to take that away um, as well as just avoid some of the first reference. Yes, Sum summary idea. Yeah, yeah. Good. Of, of, of structure that re, it, he reveals each point. It's very, very carefully put together. It reveals each point at exactly the right point, the right time. Yep. But doesn't make that everything. It yes. Immediately to the passage. Yes. Which is where it's, where it's going. You know, it's 
So we're, we're suggesting that uh, Matthew Campbell Baptist Youth is a good exemplar in this regard yes. about oh. keeping the balance between yeah. text and, and visual presentation. The coordination of that and timing uh, is, uh, is a difficult one to achieve, but uh, if it works, it works well. Yeah, so, so the advice of David McCracken was, don't, and this is for the guys in the camera, don't spend an inordinate amount of time on your visual stuff without a focus on the text. Yeah. yeah I think your sermon has to come first, and then perhaps you're, you're, I'm a dinosaur, or I'm uh, quite happy with those parts. And I think the reason mm. the talk comes is that it becomes more like a lecture or a seminar or a tutorial than okay. a sermon. Okay. So talk a little bit about the Mm. Uh, what about uh, we we used a couple of video clips today. We got there eventually, um, but <laughs> we used a couple of video clips. Would you ever think of using that in preaching, or would that distract? Do you think? I've used it once in a very similar framing setting. It was there was a TV ad that I think was was doing about um, the crossing the Red Sea. And they kind of had Moses standing there, and then he had a phone, and then he took a selfie of that. And I thought. Yeah, Alex is making the point that it, it's something that needs to be used wisely with caution. He's used it a bit in a midweek context, hasn't uh, had the courage to try it on a Sunday morning yet. Uh, it's the broader context, older folk. Um, can I add to your note of caution? I wouldn't rule it out, but I think be careful where you pick it from. Uh, let's say for the sake of argument, you, you like a snippet from a film and so you, you edit, I don't know why you can do this, I'm not sure, but this is the dinosaur talking. You edit this little clip from a film, I don't know, pick Russell Crowe from Robin Hood or something, something, okay, I, I don't know the connection of that. But you pick this little 20 second clip and you play it. And then somebody thinks, somebody in the congregation thinks, I think that was a Certificate 18 film, that. Is that what Alex is watching or, or what the pastor's watching? Do you see? The difficulty is be wise in, in where you pick this from. Uh, that, that applies also to, to quotations that you might bring in the pulpit because you, you might say, oh, I read this wonderful novel on holidays and uh, uh, they, they, there was a little story in it. You tell the story and then somebody goes to buy it. They say, it must be a great novel. They go and buy it. It's full of bad language. And they're saying, oh, that's, that's what the pastor's reading. You see, be wise. It's just about be very careful and sensitive of people. Now, I'm going to add one other thing here before lunch. And that is to say, uh, Rico Tice is a master, Christianity Explored, is a master of the use of props. Some of these are from multimedia sources. Others are just physical props. If you watch the Christianity Explored material, he, he'll hold up, for example, a DVD of the film Titanic. Uh, and he'll, he'll say, you know, uh, people today are on a sinking ship. Uh, it's all going one direction. And we need to warn them about the iceberg that lies ahead. Puts it away. Um, pulls out a rugby ball. He would. He was a rugby player. Pulls out this rugby ball uh, and talks about where the action is. Where is the action on the rugby pitch? It's where the ball is. That's what the players are interested in. Puts the ball away. Something else. Now, there are one or two of the homileticians who talk about the use of props in 
a way that far exceeds even where Rico Dice has taken them. I think of a, a guy called Blackwood, uh, who, who has a book in the library on the, uh, on the use of um, uh, multimedia and props in preaching. Um, so he'll talk about um, when you come into the pulpit, you could bring a trumpet with you if you're preaching on. What might you preach on where you could have a trumpet with you? Okay, the fall of the walls, right? Or Ezekiel's watchman or something like that. Second you could, coming. Second coming, uh, that would be a scary one. Uh, and, uh, uh, so you got this trumpet, you see. Now, it doesn't mean you have to play it. But here, here, here's this trumpet. Can you, can you imagine the watchman blowing this trumpet on the walls? Invading armies approaching. Put the trumpet away. Um, he mentions things like a boxing glove. Bring a boxing glove in. So here's this boxing glove. Um, I, Apostle, where's he going with this? Apostle Paul, I beat my body, you see, to bring it in subjection to Christ. Um, could also use it, I suppose, you're preaching a, a sermon on conflict in a local church, something like that. Uh, all kinds of things. Now, the key to this is, as far as Rico Tice is concerned, um, I, I don't know whether he's ever given expression to this, but watch him carefully. The prop doesn't dominate. It appears, and it's away again almost as quickly. That's the key to it. My temptation, if I did that, would be to keep the blessed thing out there and talk about it way too long. That's the big temptation. So just, just do it quickly and move on. But I think there is a place for that. A little bit of creativity in the way that we approach visual aids. Uh, in sermons. Yes, Alex. Sorry, I just want to make a comment. When it comes to the PowerPoints as well, if you're like in a church and you're in a church context, you don't necessarily have to do the PowerPoint by yourself. If there's if there's a person able in that church who you, you maybe know, you can ask them at the start of the series. You can maybe make a PowerPoint and just change it every week. So it's one PowerPoint at that point. I haven't used that yet, but I think about in the future, instead of me coming up with maybe the background design, ask that person and they can put that for me and include them in the ministry. Well, this is David's point earlier about the diversity of uh, people who can contribute. I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I tend to, um, my PowerPoints are all a bit samey, I have to say. Uh, I, I've got into this, what is it, or, uh, black and yellow kind of background, but, but there are other ways of doing this that are maybe more creative. And yes, it is good to use other people. Uh, I've fallen foul of this a wee bit sometimes if, you're, if you have a propensity to colour blindness, which I certainly do, um, you can pick colours that in certain environments are absolutely hopeless. So just be careful about that. You know, a yellow on a blue background or something in certain light is a disaster. So uh, uh, it's just picking something that's clear and obvious. Anyway, I, I think that uh, in this matter of of uh, the use of the cybernetics revolution. We want to, we want to contradict the, the agenda a little bit by saying that this does not mean, as Norrington says, that preaching is dead. Preaching is alive. And we want to take from Brueggemann the imagination that we can use that hopefully is a sanctified imagination and employ that in our preaching. But by the same token with Stott, uh, we, we want to say very clearly that there's an authority about the preached word that cannot be matched by anything, by anything, because the preaching of this word is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Now, with that, uh, that's a good point to finish for lunch. And so, what's our timing, guys, coming back again? Can you see on the, on the, the board there? Uh, yeah, one to one. 145 so it gives you a, a chance just to unwind for a wee while and uh, we'll see you back here again at uh, quarter to two so thanks to the guys who are online uh, for your patience as well and i'll stop the streaming at this point and then we'll resume it again at a quarter to two thanks everybody